Good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Wong, and I'm with the Journalism and Media Studies Center here at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, on behalf of our co-organizers, the School of Journalism and Communication at the Chinese University of Hong Kong and the School of Communication at Hong Kong Baptist University, I would like to thank all our panelists and moderators for, tar uh, for participating in today's symposium. And I would also like to thank all of you in the audience here and on Zoom for joining us. Uh, we would also like to thank Dean Fu Hualing and the Faculty of Law at HKU for hosting us at this beautiful venue. And, um, and before I bring our speakers onto the stage, I, will, um, I have a few housekeeping matters for the people in the audience. First, uh, please keep your face masks on throughout the event, and there's no uh, eating or drinking inside the venue. Uh, and please turn off all your electronic devices to silent or to off, and we will have a five minute break between the two panels. We are broadcasting live on Zoom right now, and we will also upload a recording onto our YouTube channel afterwards. We will be taking questions from the audience here and on Zoom. Uh, during Q&A, please keep your questions brief, and we ask that you state your name and affiliation, if any, before you pose your question. Um, and with that, I would like to bring to the stage our director at HKU Journalism, Professor Keith Richberg. Thank you. Great. Thank you for that, Jennifer, and welcome everybody here uh, to this, uh, what I hope is going to be a really interesting and lively event. Uh, you know, the Irish playwright George Bernard Shaw said sometime around 1903, beware of false knowledge, it is more dangerous than ignorance. These days, in our hyperconnected world, we're awash in this kind of false knowledge, a literal tsunami of misinformation and disinformation, some of it uh, disinformation being spread deliberately by bad actors, uh, trying to seed falsehoods into our public discourse. And some of it is misinformation being spread by people like you and me who possibly forward things on without checking the veracity uh, first. And as we have seen, this kind of misinformation and disinformation can sometimes have deadly consequences. Now, this is not new, this problem of disinformation and misinformation, as George Bernard Shaw's comments suggest. But what is new is the speed with which uh, falsehoods can spread around the world. Uh, Mark Twain said uh, he died in 1910, but he said, a lie can travel halfway around the world before the truth puts on its shoes. Actually, I should say we don't know he actually said that. I might be spreading fake news. We think he said that. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we have to check these things. But how do you combat this tsunami of misinformation and disinformation? Whose job is it? Is it the government? Is it the tech companies? Is it the consumers? Or is it all of us? To answer some of those questions, we put this panel together. I want to thank everybody for being here. Uh, this is, I believe, one of the first uh, panels like this we're doing with our uh, Chinese University of Hong Kong School of Journalism and Communication, Hong Kong Baptist University School of Communication, and us here at HKU Journalism. Now, to set the stage for what we're going to be talking about, I'm going to turn uh, the microphone over to my, my colleague and friend, Associate Professor of Practice Masato Kajimoto. He actually pioneered news literacy in Hong Kong. He runs fact checking team, and he's also uh, started and founder and runs our Annie Lab, which is a student run fact checking team. And he's going to lay the groundwork for us. And uh, I'd like to say again, welcome everybody and welcome Masato. <laughs> Well, thank you, Keith, for the kind introduction. And you actually covered many of the things I wanted to say. So <laughs> I could be quite brief, I believe. But in the next 10 minutes or so, I would like to uh, bring everybody on the same page to set the stage for the two panels that we are hosting uh, today. Uh, like Keith said, this problem itself is not a new problem. And the person I want to quote goes back 300 years. <laughs> uh, so Jonathan Swift, uh, you know, among other books, he wrote uh, Gulliver's Trouble. He said these things that you see on the slide right now. And if you think about it, this is pretty much the situation we are now in 300 years later. Things haven't changed, not so much, which indicates to us that, well, this problem is really hard to solve. 
in 300 years, we couldn't actually tackle uh, this very issue. But like Keith said, something is different in 2021, and which is the internet. And when we talked about so-called fake news law, I mean, the term itself is very problematic because you can't really define what fake news is. But when we talk about fake news regulations, we, what we have in mind is often this, toxic online content. What I mean by this is hate speech, some social media content that promotes extremism, that content that tries to radicalize people and audience. So all those uh, toxic content we call often come with elements of misinformation and disinformation. It's often come with things like fake photos, fake videos, some unsubstantiated rumors that are circulating on the internet. So all those things are very detrimental to the well-being of our society. It could be very harmful. Um, I can think of a few examples. For example, in 2013, there was a riot um, instigated by social media content in Myanmar. In 2014 and 15, we had a series of lynching and killing in India, Indonesia, and Sri Lanka, all started with internet rumors shared on WhatsApp messaging. So it has a problem, and we don't know it's an issue. Another, more recently, we all remember what happened in New Zealand, um, in Christchurch, it's a shooting in a mosque. Um, after that tragedy happened, which was broadcast live on Facebook while the assailant was killing people, New Zealand and France got together and called for action. They asked other countries and other stakeholders to get together to do something about to address this issue. So as you can see on the screen, there are many countries who already publicly signed up uh, for this call, including uh, not just countries and governments, also the tech platforms like Facebook, YouTube, and Amazon. So there is an international consensus that we got to do something. <laughs> we need more actions. Whatever we have been doing for the last five years, 10 years, is not good enough. So that's a consensus. But what should we do then? That's where today's topic come in. Is legislation the answer? And this is not just a question, because if you look around in Hong Kong, I mean, in Asia, there are already countries that enacted what we call anti-fake news laws. Uh, sometimes some countries introduce new laws, others decided to reinterpret existing laws or change the ways they apply existing laws to include online content. Cambodia, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, Vietnam, all those countries have already what we call anti-fake news laws. So we can learn from their experience. And as you can imagine, it's very problematic. <laughs> Um, I can go on talking about this topic for one semester, but I only have five more minutes left. So I'm going to be focusing on two things. Number one, the problem with on, uh, toxic online content is the volume, sheer volume of information that are circulating on the internet at the moment. So if you want to go after misinformation and disinformation, which one would you go after? Right? Hong Kong is a very polarized society, politically especially. But it doesn't matter if you are leaning towards blue side camp or the yellow camp, both sides churn out lots of potentially misleading content and share all the time. So which one do you go after? When you make that decision, you look like you are arbitrarily attacking one side and not the other side. And that's a huge problem here, right? It's just the sheer volume of information is impossible for any law enforcers or authorities to pick and choose. I mean, that action itself can be used as a political tool. And we have seen that happening in some Asian countries. Another problem with the volume is the sheer number of people who are sharing that kind of information. Let's say if there's one potentially problematic content, 30,000 people are sharing it. And it started as an internet rumor. Who should be held accountable? All 30,000 people are violating the regulation in this case, but they're simply sharing the rumors. They didn't start the rumor, but it's a rumor. We don't know who started it. Who should be held accountable? Again, authorities have to choose. They will probably choose somebody like key opinion leaders, social media influencers, or some media that are reporting about what's trending on the internet. It's a simple reporting about what's going on, but it repeats the rumor. Is that a problem? We don't know. 
So the volume is a huge problem here. Second problem is the speed. Keith already mentioned this, but it's by the time you catch potential misinformation, it's already too late, because too late because damage has been already done. And again, here I quote Jonathan Swift once again, and he said, "For a lie to be effective, you only need one hour, and it has done its job already." So if that was the situation in 1710. Probably in 2021, we only have five minutes to 10 minutes for the light to have its desired effect. And that's the challenge we are facing. Now, there are some other countries we can look at. For example, Germany has this local network enforcement act. Um, they implemented this in 2017. They decided, yes, the volume is a problem, speed is a problem. We put obligation, primarily obligation on social media platforms. So under this law, who should be held accountable first is the online service providers, platforms like Google and Facebook. It, of course, depending on the nature of the content, they are given a certain amount of time to take actions, but in some cases, they only have 24 hours. Let's say Google has 24 hours to decide whether to take down the content or not. Uh, failing to do so will you know, uh, give them in trouble. Basically, they have to pay a lot of fi um, hefty fines to the authorities. They also have an obligation to report um, that such kind of content to the authorities. And as you can imagine, it's very controversial in Germany. Right? Uh, many people question about its transparency, the difficult process to appeal the decisions, the privacy is a concern, and of course, free speech is a big concern. Now, last year, France also tried to introduce similar kind of law called uh, IVLO. Um, it's targeting hate speech mainly, but this part, uh, this hate speech law includes a section on misinformation and disinformation. Now, in France, things turned out very differently. Uh, original idea was similar to what they, people have in Germany, but that law, as soon as it was adopted in May uh, 2020, it was challenged. And one month later, uh, France, uh, you can see that on the screen, I guess, Constitutional Council decided this is unconstitutional. So they struck down most of the provisions in France. So what they have now is what experts call very diluted version of the original idea. And there are many issues that people found, but I mean experts found, but one of the sticking issue was the uh, free speech. And especially people are worried about overblocking by the platforms. Because like Germany, France wanted to make Facebook and Google and other platforms accountable. And sometimes content is like, if it's child pornography, for example, they were only given one hour to take it down. Otherwise, they will face 50 fines. What it does is Facebook or other platforms, instead of really moderating the content, they will just take down everything as long as it's sensitive, right? So they were worried about that. And uh, Constitutional Council in France decided, okay, we shouldn't have this law right now. So. In Germany, it's still in effect. France, not so much. In UK, they are currently talking about this. They published an uh, online safety bill, the draft, last uh, in May. And this has also a section in misinformation and disinformation. It's currently under discussion. So it's not just us in Hong Kong, not just Asian countries. Many, many governments all over the world are thinking about this problem and trying to do something about it. So I think it's a good time for us to be talking about this in Hong Kong as well. This is the last slide. Um, I mostly talked about laws and regulations because that's the main topic of today's event, but there are other approaches to this problem. Um, in our sector or in our field, we call it supply side and demand side solution. When we say supply side solution, we are talking about industry efforts, better journalism, fact checking, uh, content moderation by the platforms, Platforms, you know, regulate themselves, that kind of thing. Uh, demand side, we are talking about education, right? Users, so how could we be responsible? Should we teach digital citizenship in class? Do we need to equip our students with skills so that they can fact check by themselves? So those are the things that we're gonna be discussing in the second panel. But in the first panel, we're gonna be focusing on the internet governance. Is regulation the way to go or not? Um, this slide is 
what I pre uh, actually I made this slide in 2015 for a class. And when I prepared this slide for today's presentation, I didn't have to change much. The only thing I changed is the word uh, fact checking. I used to call it online social media verification. Now I call it fact checking. But other things I could just copy and paste. So in other words, what I was teaching six years ago <laughs> still stands today. And that also indicates to me that this is the time we really have to discuss this in Hong Kong. Now with that, I will stop and give the stage to the first panel. And Cliff Battle, if you could come up on stage and introduce the panel. That thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, introduction, which has uh, set the scene uh, for what I'm sure will be a very uh, lively discussion. Uh, uh, our uh, panelists will uh, take their seats. Uh, so the, the subject uh, we are discussing today, very timely, of course. Uh, uh, we, we understand that uh, the government in Hong Kong uh, is at least thinking about some sort of uh, 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 fake news law. Uh, this, of course, uh, is a, a global issue, and we have uh, a highly distinguished, high-powered panel uh, to discuss it with us today. Uh, so let me briefly introduce our panelists at the far end there. Uh, we have Professor Cherry and George, uh, professor of Me Media Studies at Baptist University. Uh, his research includes media freedom, censorship, and hate propaganda, and he has written books on media and politics in Southeast Asia. Uh, he is from Singapore. So welcome, <coughs> Professor George. Uh, uh, sitting next to Cherim, we have Daisy Lee, veteran journalist, Started out as a uh, reporter with Ming Pao, spent 18 years with Next Media, including involvement in launching Apple Daily in Taiwan. Uh, launched a news platform, Citizen News, <coughs> in 2017, and is currently editor-in-chief. Oh. Thank you. That, that, that's a little clearer, I think. <laughs> uh, then we have uh, Professor Clemenceau, uh, from Chinese University, uh, professor at the School of Journalism and Communication, uh, associate dean of the Faculty of Social Science, uh, former journalist uh, himself, uh, research includes uh, Hong Kong Press, uh, uh, and uh, we, we look forward to hearing from Clement. And last not, uh, but not least, uh, Ronnie Tong, uh, former chairman of the bar, uh, <coughs> I remember interviewing him back in uh, the 1990s. Seems a different time. Uh, uh, former legislator, uh, currently uh, non-official EXCO member uh, and uh, convener of the think tank Path of Democracy. So please welcome uh, our panelists. Uh, so, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, we've been, uh, uh, in recent days, uh, we have been uh, hearing about the, the prospect of some sort of fake news law in Hong Kong. Uh, but of course, this is uh, 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 the, the, the whole question of misinformation, disinformation, what to do about it, particularly uh, in the context of social media, uh, is a global issue. Um, I'd perhaps like to start with uh, Cherian. Um, uh, could you tell us a, a little uh, about uh, how this problem has arisen, uh, uh, what efforts have been made to, to deal with it uh, around the world, and what impact uh, does it have uh, on the free flow of information, and who controls the flow of information? Uh, thank, thanks very much, Cliff, and uh, thank you to HKU for the very kind um, uh, offer to not only uh, for my colleagues and I not only to come and participate in the event but also to co-organize it with you. I think that's an indication 
uh, of how much this uh, issue matters to us, as, as Keith pointed out earlier. Uh, I think we're, we're all in this together. And by us, I mean uh, public servants that have the interests of society at heart uh, responsible media, like the representatives uh, on the stage, uh, responsible academics. Uh, what do we all have in common? Well, basically, we live and die, well, professionally at least, uh, by the ability to, uh, to inform, educate, to move based on evidence. Right? That is what we are all about. Uh, we, we seek progress for our societies uh, based on the best available evidence uh, often working in uh, a very incomplete environment where we don't know everything yet, but we need to move on. That is what we are all about. Uh, and so it is understandable that uh, uh, all of us, responsible public servants, journalists, academics, and others, uh, have a deep vested interest in what is going on in the world today. And what is going on in the world today is alarming. What's alarming is the fact that uh, uh, despite the availability of information, uh, you have uh, large numbers of people who willfully turn away and choose to believe less good information. Uh, this is devastating for governments, it's devastating for media, it's devastating for universities. Uh, I, I, I will go so far as to say that it is devastating for the survival of the human species. Because if you think, for example, of an extreme case like climate science denial, uh, this is really going to kill us. Uh, the fact that uh, public policy and public awareness is decades behind the science. So this is not a small issue. Yeah? Um, I, I want to uh, challenge, though, one of the, um, the, the points that has been raised already, which is a common thing you hear, which is that there's something desperately new about the situation. I agree there's something new, but I don't think it is what we think it is. Uh, usually, fingers point to technology. Uh, and social media and so on. I find it hard to, uh, to, to, to lay the blame so squarely on the media uh, because simply the historical evidence uh, does not really conform to it. Uh, so for example, if you just take the last century of devastating things that has happened uh, to, to people and societies, uh, at, very much as a result of misinformation and disinformation, how many of them actually needed social media's help? Uh, think about uh, hate propaganda against Jews. Six million casualties, six million dead rather, uh, predated the internet. Uh, think about what I mentioned earlier, the one that, that is going to get us all, climate science denial. Uh, the, the, the denialists uh, managed to derail public policy, managed to confuse, to sow doubt without the help of the internet. Uh, or think about um, uh, lone wolf terrorism, right? um, uh, self-radicalization, again, squarely blamed on social media. Well, I, my guess is that if we go back to the 1940s and took a look at the gentleman who murdered Mahatma Gandhi, by today's standards, he would be called a self-radicalized lone wolf terrorist. It's just that the term hadn't been invented yet. So, so I'll be extremely cautious about uh, blaming the internet for all these things. Uh, what about this century? The, the single most devastating piece of disinformation this century was not from the Russians, uh, nor from the Chinese. It wasn't from you know, strange labs of, uh, you know, uh, uh, in, in uh, smaller countries. It was the lie from the White House regarding the existence of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Uh, that has been the most destabilizing uh, international event of the last 20 years, uh, caused uh, by lies from the top people in the White House uh, with no help from social media or the internet. Yeah? Uh, so I think that perspective is important, uh, that uh, we need to identify the causes uh, more precisely. Uh, I do think there's something new, but it's not necessarily the internet. I think what is new uh, is a seeming breakdown of trust. I think the more we regard uh, the current crisis as a crisis of trust rather than as a crisis of truth, the closer we will get to better solutions. Uh, so what is new uh, is the fact that despite the abundance of good information, and the truth is we are better informed as a species 
than any generation in the history of mankind, despite the abundance of good information, people choose to believe something else. Why? The best evidence around the world suggests that there has been a breakdown of trust in establishments worldwide, largely because large numbers of people have come to believe that the system does not work for them. They may be right, they may be wrong. I personally feel that they are largely right, uh, that they feel betrayed, that uh, establishment institutions from governments, including universities, uh, media, mainstream media, have failed to share or even care about uh, the fact that the uh, fruits of progress are not shared equitably. That's what's new. What's new is basically that the game is up for establishments. <laughs> and, and the more we understand that, uh, the less uh, attractive, I think, something as really quite uh, suspect as a fake news law would actually address these deeper issues of trust. In fact, and I'm happy to talk about this uh, you know, more after I hear from the others, I would say that something like a fake news law would do more harm than good because it would actually persuade all those millions of, well, say billions of people around the world that once again, the establishments already having power uh, now want to take even more steps to protect its own monopoly on information. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Tyrion. So uh, maybe social media is not to blame after all. Uh, perhaps uh, the, the problem uh, the new development is uh, the breakdown uh, in trust, uh, trust in the establishment, and a fake news law may make matters worse. Uh, <clears throat> perhaps I can now come to uh, Clement. Uh, <clears throat> we know that uh, around the world uh, there have been uh, many different efforts uh, to uh, combat the problem of mis- and disinformation. Uh, taking different forms, uh, uh, and the, the subject of uh, our discussion today is whether legislation is, is the best way to, to deal with it. Uh, could you tell us a little about uh, what has been going on elsewhere, and maybe what has worked and what hasn't? Okay, thank you, Chris. Uh, uh, Cliff, um, when I was invited to, to, uh, to this panel, I was thinking, what can I contribute? And then I, I remember I read something which is quite interesting and should be shared more widely. And also I have some data which uh, I want to share with you as well. So I'm going to talk about two things. Uh, one is an article which s summarizes uh, the situations in a, a number of countries. Uh, the article, it, which is actually quite long, and you can get it online, uh, is uh, printed uh, in the, uh, it's actually available in, in the website of the Pointer Institute uh, from the US. And then uh, it is uh, written by um, uh, Daniel Funk and Daniela Flamini. Uh, the name of the article is A Guide to Anti-Misinformation Actions Around the World, uh, which I find it interesting because it uh, analyzes uh, 52 countries and regions what they have been doing about this. And it, it, the, the article actually is being continually updated. So it, it is not only about a few years ago, but it, it is about the present. And um, well, I try to summarize it um, uh, uh, below. Uh, as I said, 52 countries and regions uh, were analyzed. And in fact, half of them uh, uses only one kind of action to deal with uh, misinformation. And then the other half use two or more actions. Um, there are a total of 40, 40, 40 actions uh, named in this article, not just one or two or five, it's actually 40. And the top five actions, uh, namely the first one is kind of law related, not, not law exactly, but law related, 25%. And then the second one is government-related, 19%. The third uh, one is arrest, arresting people, 12%. The fourth one is media literacy, 8%. And then the fifth one is establishing some kind of bills, 8%. Uh, 
These are the five more, more uh, popular actions taken by uh, these countries and regions. And then what, what they focus on, uh, there are actually 12 kind of uh, things they, they, they looked at. Uh, the top three, the first one is misinformation, as we can guess. Uh, uh, over 60%, uh, in fact, 62% of them focused on misinformation. And then uh, the second one is media regulation, 14%. The third one is media literacy, 10%. Again, so we can actually talk more about that uh, later in, uh, in this panel or the, the second panel. Um, 14 countries, 14, um, used law in the strictest sense. Uh, most of them, uh, 11 of the 14, they deal with misinformation. Uh, a few of them also talked about media regulation. These countries, unfortunately, are usually kind of authoritarian in nature. Uh, I, I'll give you a, a few examples, like Belarus, Bangland, uh, Bangladesh, Cambodia, Egypt, Kenya, Myanmar, uh, Myanmar and, and Vietnam. These are the, those countries using law. Uh, but there are two exceptions, as uh, uh, just mentioned, France and Germany. They have uh, laws as well. But uh, for France, uh, in the past, they usually dealt with election misinformation, only in the election context. And then for Germany, they uh, focus on hate speech, not in general, but only hate speech. So these are the two kind of uh, exceptions. And then uh, the other more traditional, so to speak, Western countries, uh, uh, democratic countries like uh, the UK, uh, the European Union, Canada, etc., and some Asian countries, uh, they tend to use other means like media literacy campaign, task force, uh, parliamentary reports, government actions, bills, etc. Um, at the US is kind of interesting because uh, it registers seven actions uh, ranging from law, uh, proposed law, not law, proposed law uh, to uh, some kind of uh, um, uh, testimony, uh, media literacy initiatives. Yeah. So I want to conclude uh, what this guy uh, has found. The first thing is that there are so many ways, 40, as I said, 40 ways to deal with misinformation. And there is little consensus. Uh, and the situation is still slowly evolving. Yeah. The second thing is law is only used by a minority of countries, uh, about a quarter. Uh, and, 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 and usually from authoritarian states. Uh, and, and then, um, oh, or some democratic states like Germany and France, but they have very specific focus. Um, in some countries, law is used together with other means. So not only law itself, but with other means like uh, reports or, or campaigns, etc. And a few of them, 12% use arrest, which is kind of uh, extreme, uh, such as Bahrain, uh, Cameroon, Egypt, Indonesia, Myanmar, Rwanda, Thailand. So these are the countries using arrest. And less co coercive ways, including government-related actions and media literacy campaign. And the focus is, of course, on misinformation. There are, so you can see there are roughly two camps. Um, the more hardline states tend to use law and arrest. And then the more liberal states uh, use, uh, choose education, investigation, and uh, other means. So the question we want to ask is, which group does Hong Kong want to stand with? <laughs> with the former group or the latter group? This is one question uh, that come to my mind after reading this report. And then the second thing I, I want to uh, share with you is about um, the Hong Kong Press Freedom Index uh, 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 done by the Hong Kong Journalists Association starting from 2013, uh, eight years ago. Um, there are 10 questions uh, uh, in this index. And one question is about the law, which uh, 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 the legal protection on news coverage. Uh, 
there are other questions. Uh, there are other questions on uh, like the inferences from governments, media owners, and management, self censorship, etc. But we we just focus on that single question uh, on law. No. Um, unfortunately, in the past eight years, the Hong Kong Press Freedom Index, uh, the, the results, uh, you, we can see that there's a downward trend very clearly. Um, they, they, they surveyed the public as well as the journalists, both uh, on a downward trend. Um, like the public is from uh, 2013, 49.4 out of 100, now down to 42.6. And then for the journalist, uh, down from 42 to 32.1. So you can see the downward trend. And then the legal protection uh, aspect has also been on, uh, uh, in, in decline. The public, 10-point uh, scale, from 5.8 to now 4.2. Uh, and, and then for the journalist, 4.6 to 2.9. The very, very uh, low score, for, uh, especially among the journalists. So, um, and then the, for the public, legal protection among the various factors, legal protection ranked third, which is kind of high, just below uh, personal safety of the journalist and self-censorship. But for the journalists themselves, they see legal protection rank only seventh, which is not very significant for them. Um, and remember, for the HKJA Press Freedom Index, when they talk about law, they ask the question, uh, they, they phrase it in terms of legal protection for the journalists. It's not against the journalists. Uh, and not just last year, they, have, uh, they, they had a, an item, a question item, uh, asking uh, the journalists um, whether the national security law, uh, what, what do they think about the national security law? 99%. 99% of the journalists re responded to the, uh, to the survey, said uh, the NSL is damaging to, the, to press freedom. So uh, then the question uh, we are interested in is, uh, we don't have laws, enough laws to protect journalism. Now uh, we are facing probably a law which is uh, which, which has a negative influence on press freedom. So that is something we should uh, take note, especially from a journalist uh, perspective. Hey. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Clement. Uh, so uh, looking, looking around the world, um, we, we've heard earlier uh, that there, there is a consensus, consensus that there is, there is a need to do something, but no consensus, it seems, on how to go about dealing with uh, this this problem, 40 different ways. Uh, which route should Hong Kong take? Uh, legislation is, is in the minority. Uh, uh, authoritarian states, is that the way we want to go uh, or not? Uh, and uh, with regard to uh, the impact on press freedom, uh, on the media, uh, uh, not too much in the way of laws to protect press freedom, do we, do we want a law that, that may curb press freedom? That brings me very nicely on to Daisy, uh, uh, working journalist, <laughs> uh, navigating a new legal landscape, national security law, uh, new data privacy laws, maybe new Article 23 laws, uh, possibly fake news law. Uh, could you give us some insight? Uh, on the uh, you know, the impact that uh, a new law on misinformation, disinformation may have on uh, journalists and on press freedom in Hong Kong. Thank you. Uh, journalists tend to be uh, a bit uh, skeptical um, than maybe than academics or, or uh, ex co members. So. Um, I hope that after you know my remarks, uh, I won't discourage too much um, some young potential reporters on the floor, uh, since uh, this is an arena that uh, train journalists. Um, but uh, to be skeptical, um, I think I think um, it's getting more and more uh, you know in in the real term. Uh, um, what we, you know, 
skeptically perceive the future can actually happen because when when you see that there's uh, not one uh, single person being convicted by this national security law yet but there's a disappearance of, a disappear of a, a 26 years newspaper and more than 800 people lost their job just in a couple of days and I hope that by the time of next year, I can still be the chief editor of uh, Citizen News and sitting here again. So, I mean, uh, being skeptic, uh, skeptical nowadays uh, is not that uh, unrealistic. So my remarks, uh, my concerns about this, net, uh, this fake news laws uh, is uh, in three flows. First of all, I think the, this potential law, the, uh, whether you call it this uh, misinformation or disinformation, but a lot of people call it uh, fake news law. I think the, uh, the the damage of this law could be even more worse than the national security law, because the, for the NSL, it's uh, sort of uh, narrowly defined. You know, uh, deal with crimes related to national security. So seditions, uh, uh, terrorist uh, activities, or collusion uh, with foreign power and danger national security, etc. But for the so-called fake news law, the net would cast uh, much wider, and it in theoretically cover everything, every information, every pieces of uh, news, um, and and. Just look at how the government operates recently. Um, there's a term, uh, I would use it, I, I would say in Chinese first, is yao kun yong zhong. I don't know how, how's the best way to translate into English. Um, to, to exercise the power to its fullest extent, to stress the limit. So this, you know, the whole governments um, operate under this notion. They were not, Restrained uh, their power to exercise uh, under the, the, the power under the law or or other uh, power, but to exercise it to the fullest extent. So under this notion, and with a new law in the future, and my worry is that it cover it will cover everything, uh, not just uh, national security, even with with with, with, string, uh, with, um, with from NSL. But all the policy area, on, or not just government act, but also maybe any information related to the private sector or big companies could become um, a weapon under this new law. And for journalists, whether uh, a lot of people, just uh, two speakers share their, their thoughts about is on focus more on social media, but whether we, at this point of time, we don't know yet the details of the law. But judging from you know all these senior officials, they're talking about Gazan Man, fake news. So I don't think the journalists or the news will be escaped from this new potential law. So this is one of my concern, and the second concern would be. Um, the way uh, the imbalance of uh, you know information, the controlling of the information between the government and also the the general public or the or the journalists, while the government control all the informations, and the way how they disseminate these informations, for the journalists there's no sufficient check and balance or sufficient power um, enable us to get access to all this information. So if the intention of the government is for this, you know, the, the, the fake news laws is, the, the real intention is really to minim, minimize the damage of fake news or, or, or misinformation, the damage to society, then theoretically the government should have, you know, journalists to, you know, fact checking their, their stories, to, to have them to 
dig out, you know, information and to have them to um, substantiate their stories. But in the reality, it's not the case. Um, not, not just now, but also uh, day back to actually the whole period of time and, and a couple of years ago, it's really difficult for us to access to information. So um, we've been trying, for example, one of the uh, case that uh, my, my reporter tried to work on uh, is to ask the, gov uh, uh, to ask the uh, police to, they have a police general order, okay? And we discovered that this day, uh, some of the chapter was not, was not disclosed to the public. And even the heading of this chapter was not disclosed to the public. So we filed a question to the police uh, department and asking uh, for a disclosure. And of course, that, um, they would come back saying that uh, it's un because of the security reasons uh, and operational matters, they're not going to disclose it. Um, but we're asking, we just want to know the index, the index of the chapter, not the detail. But still, we, can, we got this answer. So we put the case to um, a further level. We used the access to information code to ask for the release of the heading. I emphasize just the heading of the, of the chapters. And it took you know, another couple of months and it was denied again. So then we took, we took this further level to the ombudsman and we you know, file a question, uh, file a, a, a request or a complaint to the ombudsman. And they took nine months to investigate and come up with a, a, a report or result uh, saying that um, they believe that the police department should disclose the index of, this chap of the chapters because they don't see there's any harmful effect or, or, or anything that can you know, damage uh, uh, the operation of the police by releasing only the index of this police general order. So this is a very clear result and we, it took us more than a year to come to that stage. But as you can see, it's the government or uh, the police still ignore the decision or the, 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 the ruling of the uh, ombudsman because it's no binding effect at all. So by, by, cite, by citing this example, I just want to say that uh, journalists want to do their job properly to disseminate information correctly. We don't want to do any fake news, but in reality, there's a, there's a lot of hurdles uh, facing us. So this story is just, you know, we take time and, and we, we, you know, waste our time in, in pursuing the story. But even worse is that a more vivid case recently is that, uh, I'm, I'm sure everybody, you know, knows about that. It's, uh, it's, about, uh, it's about Choi's case. She's the um, freelance uh, documentary director for RTHK. She was prosecuted and convicted because she wants to find out, you know, uh, she put up a request to find out the details of a car information uh, related to the uh, June 21 uh, Yunnan incident. And this is the only way that we can do, and this is always this is a very important tool for journal, uh, investigative mm. journalists to use to find out information. And yeah, Daisy, if I can, because um, <clears throat> we're in the interest of, of time, oh, okay. um, oh, I, I just just to, to finish finish the story. Um, sure. So uh, <coughs> okay, yeah. just one one sure. one, one last <laughs> thank you uh, worry is if this law enacted. Uh, my worry is that would, would then the next step is to license journalists. Would a, a registration for journalists would become an, the next step? Thank you. Thank you.
Um, thank you. So, <coughs> difficult environment for journalists, even in, in the current situation. Um, <coughs> your Bao Choi was uh, convicted for uh, <coughs> after using a, a government uh, a database, um, was uh, accused of, of making a false statement. Um, <coughs> Concerns that a fake news law will add to to this burden, uh, and will uh, uh, make the <coughs> make it more difficult for journalists to do their job. So, Ronnie, if I can uh, come to you uh, now, you're you're sitting there on Exco. Uh, so, of course, we're all looking to you uh, to tell us what it is uh, that the the government uh, has in mind. Now, I know. We, we had a little discussion about this before we, we took our seats, but um, <clears throat> perhaps I can, uh, can ask you for the benefit of, benefit of everyone. Um, what, what is the government's thinking? Do you know? Uh, thank you, Cliff. Uh, uh, Cliff, in fact, emailed me last night and asked me what I'm going to say. I said, I have no position. Uh, I, I, in fact, I have nothing to say, and what I wanted to do is come and listen and... Uh, and, and maybe make some responses. Um, but before I go into what I want to say, having heard everybody before me, I don't want to uh, disseminate misinformation to you. I'm here in my personal capacity. I do not represent the government. I do not know anything more than what is reported publicly by the media in relation to what the government is going to do. You can believe me or you, you don't have to believe me that that is the situation. Having said that, um, and having heard everybody, including the two uh, short speeches before we came on stage, I, I know what I'm going to say now. Uh, I, f I feel that I should first of all lay a general background to this question here. Fake news, is legislation the answer? And then I want to highlight three issues for everybody to focus on. Uh, the three issues I regard to be most taxing, difficult issues that we have to overcome. Now, by way of general background, um, I have to remind you of what the international governor on civil and political rights say about freedom of speech and freedom of press. The ICCPR, the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights, for those uh, who are not familiar with it, is a UN-sponsored international covenant. It has over 100 signatories to the covenant. Uh, China is a signatory but it has not rectified it, so it doesn't apply on the mainland. Um, Hong Kong is not strictly a signatory, but because UK was a signatory and we were a colony, and therefore we were treated as a signatory to the covenant, other than one reservation, which doesn't concern us today, is about democracy, but that's for another day. But the international covenant on civil and political rights uh, is enshrined not only in our local law, but in our basic law. So it's part of the basic law. So we cannot ignore it, right? And I want to remind you of what it says, uh, you know, about freedom of speech. And I'm going to read it out because this is easier. I don't want to misinterpret or misinform you. It says the exercise of the rights, and of course, when they talk about the rights, it is a freedom the right of freedom of speech and the right of freedom of the press. The exercise of the rights provided for in paragraph two of this article carries with it special duties and responsibilities. It may therefore be subject to certain restrictions, but these shall only be such as are provided by law and are necessary. A, for respect of the rights or reputations of others. B, for the protection of national security or of public order, ordinary public. Ordinary public is not strictly public order. It is about general situation of the community or of public health or morals. Now, having read that and having reminded you 
that the ICCPR is part of the basic law, it means that Hong Kong has no option. It has no option. The only option he has got is to introduce a law, if he wants to deal with this issue, right? And the only way in which the law can deal with this issue would be on four grounds. For the respect of rights and reputations of the individual, for the protection of national security, we already have that, of public order or morals, sorry, of public health or morals. Now that is the background. So the question was wrongly set because it doesn't admit any other answer. We have to do it by law. So, so now the second, Ronnie, can, can, I just, can I just finish? I just, I just want to clarify. Yes. Yeah. Um, sorry to interrupt, but I, I just want to clarify. What you, you say it has to be done by law. That's because of the terms of the ICCPR, which says must be provided by law. Because form. of the but basic that's, law. A, that's only if you're restricting human rights, yes? Yes. So is it, isn't that bringing us back to, to the whole issue um, here? Well, uh, I think yours is a question. I can deal with that later. Uh, but, but well, you know, everything, when, when you talk, when you, when you want to give an opinion, publicly, you are exercising a right of freedom of speech. Right. And so there's no escape from it, right? But I want to come back to what I want to say. That's the general background. But there are three most difficult issues that we have to focus on. Number one, how to enforce it. Two, how to define it. Three, where to draw the line. Now let me just Deal with it very briefly. I know time is short, but I think this is necessary. How to enforce it? Enforcing it is a problem, particularly in relation to internet information. Now, you may not know it, or you may not remember it, but we did have some legislation introduced by way of emergency regulation during the time when we have riots in the streets. The government introduced emergency regulation, and in there is a law, a regulation, which deals with internet information. Now, the government wanted to introduce some sort of provision which carries with it sanction against internet providers. For example, to stop certain posting or to get information. But at the end of the day, we didn't. The government didn't. Why? Because most, if not all, of the service providers are not in Hong Kong. The long arm of the law in Hong Kong can re cannot reach them. Now, as a matter of fact, during the, the, the emergency regulation, at the time when it survived, because it only survived for three months, and we didn't extend it, so it lapsed. Now, during that time, the government did ask several service providers, like uh, 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 Telegram. Telegram was the, the main one, to take down certain posting, not to disseminate certain information, and to provide information. The uh, Telegram agreed not to disseminate the question information, but refused to give particulars. But the government could do nothing because we cannot sanction them. Now, the second legislation we have, we already have for over a year, is national security. Now, under the national security law, there is a regulation which deals with internet information. And in there are provisions which, again, require the service providers to take down certain information if they infringe upon national security, and to provide information. And they would be fined if they refuse to comply. But as far as I know, it has never been exercised so far. And even if it were to be exercised, probably would have no effect because many of the service providers are not in Hong Kong. You must remember, you must have read the news that recently uh, uh, Facebook and Google, they uh, say, that if Hong Kong were to introduce a fake news law, they would leave Hong Kong. 
Don't believe so, so it. What, so right. Don't so believe what, what it. Is <laughs> yeah, because what they're saying is they would take the personnel out of the jurisdiction of Hong Kong so that we cannot uh, apply sanction to them. But they will continue to provide service to you. You will still be able to use Facebook. The only way in which Facebook would be banned would be the Hong Kong government said, because you're out of the jurisdiction, I can't sanction you, and you are disseminating false information, so I'm going to ban you. I'm going to put up a firewall, like what is happening on the mainland. When you go on the mainland, you can't access Facebook, you can't access Google, because the government put up a firewall as a sanction to protect themselves. Right? Now, I don't think Hong Kong will go that, that route, but I'm just letting you know that there are these difficulties, which at the moment, there seems to be no answer. Now, one answer is to require all service providers to be landed in Hong Kong, to set up a branch here so that they could be sanctioned. But what if they disagree? They will not do that. How are you going to enforce that? You can't enforce that, the short answer is. So that's the first problem. The second problem is, um, how do you define fake law? What? Sorry, fake news. Fake law. What is fake news? Right, fake right? news. Now, we all know that that Twitter's and and Facebook sanctioned Donald Trump during the election. But frankly, I don't like Donald Trump. But he was just talking about nonsense. I mean, he wasn't disseminating fake news as such. Right? Nobody listens to him anyway. Now, a professor just now read from an article. That article was gravely outdated. But was it giving you fake news? Was it, was it disseminating misinformation? The article didn't mention about Singapore, or didn't mention about India. India was the largest democracy in the world, right? 1.3 billion people, right? This morning, if you read Reuters report this morning, uh, the Indian court ruled that tweeters, because they failed to comply with the, with the regular, uh, regulatory provisions in India, has now lost is what is called user content immunity. What is meant by that? User content immunity means that if the user of Twitter infringes the law, the service provider is not liable because it's user who, who infringes the law. But once they lose the user content immunity, it might mean that they're personally liable. So they can be sanctioned. So are they going to leave India? 1.3 billion people? OK, Ronnie, we, we need to move on to, to Q&A. Right, right. So I mean, can you, but can you but just... But I, just want yeah. to, I just want you to sit up and think about this. Think about this. It's not easy to draw a line to define what is fake news. It's much easier to deal with doxing. Right. And I understand the government is dealing with that. Right? So I'm not I, sure I, about the government is trying to right. deal with fake, it, this fake is, news. It, this is important to, to get to this. You're, you're, you're saying that uh, the government's focus is, you, you believe, is, is I, doxing. I've been trying to tell you, Cliff, yep. that I have no, no, no inside information. But I want to say yeah. that as far as I hear, doxing is the more important issue rather than fake news. So d despite we, we've had remarks and, uh, and, from... And, and, and the, uh, the problem that I mentioned just now, yep. um, it is more difficult to deal with fake news than to deal with doxing. Right? So anyway, I move on to the third issue. Well, we, we need to have some, some Q&A, Ronnie. Otherwise, I, I want to, to yes. I, 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 I'd like to take some some questions. Q and A, <coughs> but the third issue is where to draw the line. Now, what I want to say is that I'm a lawyer. I, I believe in the law. I believe in the rule of law, right? And therefore, the line should be drawn on in relation to the issues that I just mentioned when I first start to speak. In other words it would only be relating to respecting people's rights and reputation, national security, order republic, 
health issues and morals. Politics is not within those four issues. Okay, right. if I if I can, no, no, I haven't finished. No, well, I have sorry, not look, we <coughs> we no. we don't. No, Ronnie, the Ronnie, other the Ronnie, other please. necessary thing. Ronnie, I'm the judge. Please, no, <laughs> no I'd like I to have take to some. Say this, otherwise, yeah. they would be misinformed. Okay, can you make it right. very now, very quick? The other I would issue like to get to is that any questions. limitation or restriction by law must be necessary and proportionate. Right. That is the other difficult issue. In other words, even if the statute were to draw a line the court will still have to come in to decide whether certain limitation or sanction is necessary and proportionate. Because I try to remind everybody again and again, it's already written into our basic law and therefore we have to abide by it. There is no getting away from it. Okay, Th thank you very much. Uh, so, <coughs> fake news law is going to be going to be difficult. Doxing, you believe, is you have no inside information, but it, it seems doxing is the priority, not so much a fake news law. Uh, and any action that is taken legally will have to comply with the uh, requirements of the, the ICCPR. Okay. Uh, questions, please. Uh, are there any questions on Zoom that we yes. need to... Yes, uh, we do have a question from Cherian has a question. <laughs> Actually, Cherian, uh, Professor George, you may be able to answer this one. We have one. Yeah, can we can we can we entertain one question? Can we entertain one question first okay. over Zoom? It's from Justin Drung. He's uh, one of our part-time master students. He asked that the fake news law in Singapore requires required that several Facebook posts suggesting. Uh, COVID vaccination resulting in stroke or death be removed and the post owners to issue corrections. This seems to have helped with the vaccination rates in Singapore and uh, but are and that uh, you know but in Hong Kong we are way behind so would such uh, you know kind of fake news law in Hong Kong be a way out uh, for our you know COVID vaccination lag and uh, but potentially also in other areas apart from public health. Okay, uh, on, on Singapore, um, well, I should say first that a lot of this discussion uh, you know, is deja vu because we had similar discussions two and a half years ago uh, in Singapore. Uh, people like me were completely unsuccessful in making the government uh, think twice about the fake news law, uh, but here I am again. The, uh, uh, is uh, Singapore's fake news law, uh, uh, it's an online, online falsehood law responsible for decline in vaccine hesitancy? I'm not aware of any connection that's been proven between the two. Yeah? Uh, if anything, the, the word of mouth that I'm receiving is that uh, despite the um, existence of the uh, online falsehood law, uh, there remains a worrying degree of vaccine hesitancy. It hasn't really tackled the misinformation. Um, the, uh, I, I think we should also note that uh, health authorities around the world, including the World Health Organization, which of course is extremely concerned about uh, these infodemics, uh, has not pushed for criminalization or legislation of uh, medical misinformation. They've instead pushed for uh, health authorities uh, to be much uh, more vigorous in giving out good information, media literacy, and so on. Yeah? Uh, so that must say something, that even health authorities who have the most to lose from misinformation are extremely hesitant about introducing laws. Uh, the, the final point I'd make about Singapore is that it's an, ex uh, it's an irrelevant example for Singapore for the reasons that Ronnie said. Uh, Singapore is one of the few countries that has not signed the ICCPR, uh, does not even give lip service to it. Uh, so it should, in fact, uh, Hong Kongers should greet it with some alarm if Hong Kong authorities want to learn from Singapore. It would actually be going against what Ronnie uh, recommends. Okay, Jerry, and you had a question of your own, I believe. Well, actually, it had to do with uh, the ICCPR as well. I just wanted, uh, when, I, when I heard Ronnie talk about uh, the ICCPR, I felt reassured. Um, but then I, I was wondering whether I misheard you and I should instead panic. Right? And I, I suspect that was why Cliff wanted a clarification as well. Uh, I, I was reassured if what you mean is that if Hong Kong 
chooses to restrict free speech through law, uh, it has no option but to apply the three-part test of uh, legality, necessity, and legitimacy uh, as required by the ICCPR. That would be reassuring. I, uh, if on the con uh, can may I finish the question? Yeah. Uh, if, uh, on the other hand, what you mean is that the ICCPR gives Hong Kong no option but to use the law, then I would say that's completely, um, that's well, that, that would be reason to panic if that is the interpretation, and it would be completely at odds uh, with international interpretation of what the ICCPR is. Sorry, I don't understand the last part. It, it has to do with uh, your use of the term Hong Kong has no option. Yeah. It was a little ambiguous, so I just wanted to give you the opportunity to clarify. Uh, do you mean that Hong Kong has no option but to abide by the three-part test if it chooses to use law? Or do you mean Hong Kong has no option but to use the law? Mm. No. It's an entirely different meaning. Uh, no, no. Uh, I try to <laughs> convince everybody, but it seems that nobody believed me. Uh, Hong Kong uh, is totally committed to the rule of law. And that means that we have to comply with decisions of the CFA, the Court of Final Appeal. And the CFA has said more times than I can remember that the ICCPR has got to be applied strictly and the three-part test will be carried out. And indeed, that was the reason why my understanding uh, is that the, the administration has been very hesitant in bringing about this law is that before they can satisfy themselves that it would not be struck down by the court, they are not going to do it, right? In other words, they have to do it in such a way that they, they at least be uh, satisfied themselves that it has a chance of surviving uh, the court. Uh, and, right. and, and, and I'm being on the ex uh it is my duty to point it out to the government. And I, you know, I can assure you, I do it every time. Okay. So just to clarify, you, you were not saying that the ICCP requires Hong Kong to, to pass a law. You were saying if Hong Kong passes a law, it must meet these requirements. No, the, the other way around. Because we have yeah. to comply with the ICCPR, therefore, we can only do it by legislation on the four grounds that I mentioned. Right. Okay. Okay, um, thank you. Daisy, um, are you reassured ICCPR will apply? Uh, uh. I don't want to uh, no. mislead you. I'm not the chief executive. Right? <laughs> so what I say is my personal opinion. Is, we understand. Is what I believe in. You know, I'm totally committed to it, but maybe one man's person is not enough, and one man's, you know, doing his best is not enough. The whole community has got to understand that we have to support the basic law. We have to use the basic law to protect our values. Daisy. A well, uh, uh, simple answer is no, it's not reassurance at all. And still, I mean, I, mean, um, I, I do have that confusion uh, as well, that you, you mean that uh, there's no option but to legislate on fake news? Yes, yes. If the government were to introduce some administrative measure, I'm almost confident it would be struck down immediately by the courts. Because, because the because, ICCPR says yeah. it has to be limited by law. If you are going to restrict human rights, it has to be done by a law, and that law must be necessary and proportionate and, and, and so on. Based on those four issues. But I, I think we would hope to try to do it without restricting human rights. <laughs> In which case, maybe we wouldn't need a law. <laughs> Clement. <clears throat> Actually, I, I, frankly, I don't have quite understand it because I don't know the law very much. But I, I'm thinking uh, some other countries will also be a signatory. How would they deal with it it's from mm -hmm. a comparative perspective? How uh, they they will face similar situations. How, uh, what lessons can we learn from them? Yeah. 
pretty much every country in I the world. Understand, I understand, for example, India is a signatory. I, mean, I, I may be wrong, but I'm always sure that India uh, uh, is a signatory. And, and India ha has regulatory laws. I just mentioned, uh, look, look up the, the report by Reuters uh, this morning. Uh, uh, and so that's how you do it. I mean, you introduce a, a law, and then the law would have to be applied by the courts. And uh, as I say, the report which I read this morning was that the India court did so rule, but of course it's subject to appeal. So your <coughs> if there is a law and it comes to Exco, um, you will be seeking to ensure that that law uh, <coughs> has a, a minimal impact on, on freedom of expression uh, and uh, press freedom. Is that, that, that to put in very simple terms what, what the ICC oh, I, I hope the government will not be so stupid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's one. Thank you. I could So hi and um, thank you for your um, discussion at the symposium regarding this matter. So I just want to ask... Um, Could you tell us who you are, please? Sorry. Thank you. Uh, yeah, my name is Shamil, and I'm a journalism student at the Hong Kong Baptist University, and I came to attend this thank talk. Um, so my question is, uh, do news companies and news establishments have to use social media to like disseminate news? Because what social media has done is to exas exacerbate uh, you know, the pro proliferation of uh, fake news. So... In a, let's say Facebook, for example, you have all sorts of information going around. And uh, you also have factual information, but when it, when it becomes mixed with, uh, you know, fabricated and, and misleading information, it just becomes a mess. So uh, do you think uh, it's time for news companies and news establishments to move out of social media and, and you know, uh, have their own domain like they had before uh, the advent of social media? Okay, thank you. Maybe Daisy, uh, can we can we as news organisations uh, shut down our websites and uh, not not use uh, social media to uh, uh, disseminate our news? I think um, well, we do have our own domain. I mean, all almost all news organisation has their own domain on website. Uh, whether they chose to use social media or what, which social media to have disseminate their news is uh, another matter. It, 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 it doesn't really, I, I mean, it's something separate. You have to ensure that, I, I mean, we have to ensure that what we report, uh, you know, true. Uh, but whether we use social media to disseminate it is something, I, I think, unrelated. So, yeah, that's my answer. There's another question. <laughs> All right, thank you. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I teach uh, students uh, primary to high school in communications. Very meaningful topic and I gained a lot today. Uh, with the topic, is legislation the answer? I would start with the assumption we recognize something needs to be done and professor and everybody did preface that. It's a, it's a problem for many years. I have the following idea, suggestion for the panel to feedback and give insights. Based on two main ideas. First is standard of care. There are gradients of people with different level of influence. Journalists, I mean like doctors, lawyers, we all with responsibility and influence, with influence and power comes responsibility. Can we leverage that standard of care and have different content creator be tagged with different type of sanctions. The second idea is tagging. As a user, I'm confused with all these things flying around. It helps when the source and the information come with a tag, be it T1, T2, T3. If you're a news and journalist with license, you know, news going worldwide, I expect your T1 when I receive something on the phone and it has a tag, T1, I'm going to trust it more than like a friend next door who came with a T10, just a normal person like me. 
So I want to suggest these two ideas to, fill, to put it back to all the experts. And lastly, I'll just close off by borrowing the idea of food items. It takes time for us to be educated about what's healthy and unhealthy, mm. with a lot of misnomers in between. So it takes time. The sanctions doesn't need to be hit in one go, it's just like driving. You know, there's going to be an appeal board, a review board. Oops, you didn't check your news. You're a journalist. You should have, you get, you know, snap, you, you get a, 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 you know, points deducted. Eventually, you know, eventually people learn, and hopefully not at the point of losing license, but there's going to be consequence. That's natural learning. So three, three ideas. I want to throw it back to the panelists. What's your thinking and feedback? Sorry. Took a little long. Can, can I deal with this? Uh, sure. It's a very good question, but I, I think people must understand that if there is going to be legislation on the issue, it's not a black and white attempt. The legislation can come in at various levels, right? The mildest level is the example I used, the emergency regulation, which merely empowers the government to issue a request or an order but there is no sanction. So that if you disobey the order, nothing would happen, right? That's the lowest uh, uh, intervention. The next level would be that they can ask you to take down the material, not to disseminate it, and if you refuse, you will be fined, right? That's the next level. The third level is to punish you for simply publishing it. And the third level would be to punish the publisher or the editor. The fourth level would be to punish everybody who's got anything to do with it, including the reporter. The reporter, fortunately or unfortunately, is very low on the list of priority, right? But theoretically speaking, you can have a legislation which says anything, anybody having anything to do with an infringing piece of news or article would be put in jail. That's the ultimate, right? I certainly hope that we, ne we will never come near that. We, I rather think that we're really looking at, you know, the first two rungs, the two levels, you know, that if we ask you, please take it down, and if we refuse to take it down, take it down, we will fine you, which is, what the national security regulation uh, is uh, is all about. Uh, other panelists, Jerry. Uh, yeah, comment um, uh, on tagging. Uh, I think um, uh, many social media companies are already doing this or experimenting with it. It's not perfect, but they've already started. For example, putting health warnings on. Um, on sources that are really suspect uh, and downgrading them and so on. So that's already in the works. Importantly, it's not being done by law. It's being done uh, through self-regulation, industry self-regulation and so on. Um, and I think we would have a problem uh, if this comes with uh, teeth, so to speak. You know, if, if we rely on governments to do it, I think most countries, peoples would not um, uh, be very happy about it. Uh, partly because of the your second point, which is extremely important, that you know, misinformation on its own is usually not very powerful unless it comes from an influential source. Yeah? So uh, what we have to worry about is misinformation multiplied by power. Yeah? And if you think uh, and, and you identified some of the groups in society that have that kind of influence, uh, doctors, professionals, journalists, and so on, but what is the group in any society that has the most power is the state. So <laughs> I go back to the point I raised at my, uh, you know, that, that millennia of experience tells us that the misinformation that really kills us, uh, hopefully not us, but kills people in general, is, is misinformation from the state. Yeah? Uh, so which is precisely why, you know, uh, that, that uh, all that uh, historical knowledge resulted in something like the ITCPR. This is the human species trying to protect itself from one of the most proven harms that society can do to itself, which is to allow power to combine with knowledge. 
right? Uh, conversely, most of the progress that human society has made over the last 300 years has been uh, the result of delinking in power and knowledge by making sure that knowledge instead is held to a, a standard of evidence and so on, right? We believe it not because of who says it, but because we have tested it. Almost everything you can think of in our life that has allowed us to live longer and better lives, whether it's vaccines or uh, mobile phones, if it does make us live better lives, right, is the result of the delinking of power and knowledge. The extremely retrograde, it is ignoring thousands of years of historical uh, uh, lessons to say, no, no, let's put them back together. Let's give the powerful the right to, de to decide what is good knowledge and bad knowledge. Bad idea, right? Uh, uh, the, the final point I'd make is that, um, you know, we, we seem to be talking a lot about punitive measures, uh, which is, I think, a very bad way to look at it. Uh, because I, again, I go back to this point that we need to look at the positive side, that, uh, uh, that our species has never had better capacity to build and share knowledge. If we want to fight bad information, we should be empowering the institutions that are capable of producing and sharing good information. Yeah? So job number one of any government who is seriously interested in combating uh, this, this fake news tsunami is not to go around sniper-like shooting down bad information. No. Go out and empower the institu institutions in your society that are dedicated to fighting that battle with you. And that includes journalists like Daisy. It includes academics like Clement. Right? Those, those are your institutions. You want to you build up uh, academic freedom so that academics can fight with you. You want to build up press freedom so that journalists can fight with you. Uh, any, any solution that instead undermines these institutions is bound to actually take us back decades or centuries. Okay, thank you, Sharon. Uh, perhaps uh, we could uh, wrap up. Can I just, just ask yes or no then? Um, each panelist, Sharon first, uh, do we need legislation or not? I think the world needs to regulate social media companies more. Uh, not individual users, but we need to find ways to break the harm that they are doing through monetizing bad habits. Uh, that is something that we can do. Uh, there may be a room for, for uh, uh, regulating medical misinformation because of the harm that causes, but again, you know, we need to pay attention to the fact that even the WHO doesn't, is not actually pushing that. Beyond that, politics, news, no, lay off. Okay, thank you. Daisy, yes or no? My answer is short, no. <laughs> thank you. Clement? Basically, no. Uh, if you want to do it, uh, the conditions have to be specified very clearly. Uh, otherwise, it, it would do more harm than good. Thank you. And Ronnie? Well, Cliff, you know I have no choice. Uh, <laughs> given what happened in 2019, I think the answer is yes. That is, not the, the, that is not all. I think the more important issue is how rather than, you know, if. Okay. Thank you. Well, well thank you to all of our panelists. Clearly, uh, there's uh, going to be much more debate uh, on this issue. Uh, 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 please uh, give them a big uh, round of applause. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Um, thank you for having me here today. Um, so today we'll be hearing perspectives uh, from politics, from civil society, from academia. Um, what I would like to do is to present uh, misinformation from the audience perspective. And so the Reuters data uh, from the Digital News Report will be a good opportunity to give some general findings. Um, very briefly about the uh, Digital News Report. It's an annual comparative survey conducted by the, uh, the Reuters Institute of Journalism at Oxford University. And uh, this year, in the latest edition, um, it covers over 46 markets. And, uh, and Hong Kong has been featured since the 2017 uh, edition. So this is 
our fifth year as collaborators uh, with Reuters. And every year the uh, survey is run uh, around uh, January, February, and we ask a host of questions related to news consumption and how people in Hong Kong feel uh, about um, different uh, subjects related to news. And so what I'd like to share today are specific uh, findings related to misinformation, which is today's topic. One uh, recurring question we ask every year uh, is this question. Thinking about online news, I am concerned about what is real and what is fake on the internet. And what we have found is that uh, consistently in the previous four years, um, the percentage of respondents who tend to agree or strongly agree uh, is around 40 to 50 percent. So in our previous two reports, we've actually found that over half of respondents uh, are kind of concerned with what is real and what is fake on the internet. And related to uh, trust, uh, which Cherian mentioned previously, um, so there is some uh, descriptive data on trust in news I consume, trust news in general, trust news in search engines, and, and on social media. I won't go into too much detail about those, uh, um, those uh, measures, but um, uh, what I've highlighted here are the percentage, percentage figures of those who, who tend to disagree or strongly disagree. Okay, so we can see that uh, tend to be social media and uh, news from search engines uh, that people tend to uh, distrust more relative to what they consume uh, themselves and in general. Where are the concerns? Uh, how are the um, concerns derived? So in the last year's uh, edition of the DNR, we asked the question, which of the following, if any, are you most concerned about online? Please select one and false or misleading information from. And the, uh, the most popular choice was the government, politicians, or political parties. And then we also have activists or activist groups. And bearing in mind, this was the 2020 uh, edition. So uh, this has to be uh, interpreted from the context of what was happening in Hong Kong during that time. And uh, you have ordinary people, journalists, uh, or news organizations, and so forth. Very few people are not concerned with any of these uh, actors. In this year's uh, edition, we asked specifically about COVID, um, false or misleading information uh, from these actors related to COVID uh, information. Again, government, politicians, and political parties is the top, um, and uh, journalists and news organizations second, and followed by activists or uh, activist groups. Okay, so it's, this, it's again, um, the top being um, the government, politicians, and political parties. In terms of platforms, this year we also asked about um, um, false or misleading information from certain platforms. And so the number one choice was uh, information or news from news websites or apps, followed by Facebook uh, messaging applications, which in the Hong Kong context would typically be uh, WhatsApp and, uh, and um, Facebook Messenger uh, and so forth, followed by search engines, YouTube and Twitter. Um, very few people uh, in comparison um, mentioned that they were not concerned with any of these uh, potential uh, sources of misleading information. In terms of exposure to information, in this year's report, uh, we actually asked them, have you seen false or misleading information about any of the following topics in the last week? And in, for this example, uh, they were able, they could select more than one choice. And perhaps unsurprisingly, um, the uh, COVID-19 was the, uh, the top choice, uh, followed by politics, and then maybe somewhat surprisingly, immigration, and then uh, news or information about celebrities and products, products and services uh, uh, and, and so on, okay? Uh, again, relatively few people ans uh, answered uh, none of these, okay? And, and, and who answered don't know. In the 2019 report, we asked about what actions um, people took to, uh, to somehow alleviate, attenuate the, the impact of, of misleading information. And so 
um, the most popular uh, action that was taken was uh, checking a number of different sources to see whether a news story was reported in the same way. So maybe uh, triangulating the same story from different news sources and deciding not to share a news story because uh, the in individual was unsure about its accuracy. Discussing a news story with a person uh, I trust because I was unsure about its accuracy. Started relying more on sources of news that are considered more reputable. Stopped using certain news uh, sources because I was unsure about the accuracy of the reporting and finally uh, paying attention to news shared by someone because I'm unsure whether I trust that person. And so 76% of respondents uh, in this sample did at least one of the uh, above actions. And so what can we, uh, how can we summarize this data from an audience perspective? Um, well, generally speaking, um, we can say that based on the data of online um, users in Hong Kong, a substantive number of respondents in Hong Kong were concerned with false or misleading information, particularly from political actors and from various digital platforms. Over 50% have come across some form of false or misleading information, which is um, quite concerning. However, over 75% have in some way changed their news consumption habits or actively sought to authenticate information they receive in order to ensure the veracity of news they receive. So this is more assuring in that um, over three quarters of the people uh, in the survey did take some form of action uh, in order to verify, uh, in order to uh, um, to check the, ver the veracity of information that they receive. Okay, so this is a very short, quick uh, kind of a presentation. Uh, the, the latest edition of the uh, Digital News Report was actually released last week. And so you're welcome to read our um, profile for, from Hong Kong. And, uh, and in the profile, we did discuss the implications of the, uh, of the security law uh, on uh, journalism in Hong Kong and so forth. So, so uh, not only for Hong Kong, but also for the other markets as well. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Chan. Uh, I would like to now bring up the second panel uh, that will be moderated by Dr. Masato Kajimoto. Uh, yes, yes, please, uh, panel members, come on stage. <laughs> Kind of hard to talk. <laughs> Distance is really wide, but have a seat. Have a seat. All right. So um, we've already met Dr. Michael Chan. So could I ask each one of the panel members to briefly introduce who you are and what you do? And maybe we start with Rachel. Yeah. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Rachel Blundy. I'm a senior fact check editor for Agence France Press, um, based in Hong Kong. Um, I've been a journalist for more than 10 years, uh, firstly um, in the UK and for the last five years in Hong Kong. And AFP covers um, 14 countries and territories in the Asia Pacific region for fact checking, uh, which we launched in 2017. Thank you. Kenneth? Oh, thank you. Uh, my name is Kenneth. I'm from the Hong Kong Federation of Youth Groups. Uh, I'm the supervisor of the organization, and I have oversee quite a lot of services right now about multimedia services, about uh, STEM education, as well as some user experience. And currently we're doing some research about uh, media literacy and digital literacy, and we do concern about the behavior of young people and consumption of the internet information and content, and how do they treat, um, and how, how do they perceive the information and, and what they do as well, yeah. All right, thank you. Hi, I'm Oi Wan. I'm the East Asia editor of a website called Global Voices and also a volunteer editor for a local fact checker project called Fact Check Lab. I also teach in the CUHK on a MPhil course, uh, New Media and Society, so I've been observing uh, the disinformation issue. 
I'm Alice Lee. I'm uh, teaching at the Hong Kong Baptist University Department of Journalism. Uh, I'm in the field of media literacy. Um, in the past 20 years, I promote media information literacy in Hong Kong and offering uh, workshops and talks to uh, students, teachers, and parents. Um, I cooperate with other scholars to conduct media literacy research uh, in Hong Kong, mainland China, and I also do research for UNESCO. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, second panel's topic is what you see on the screen right now, alternatives to legislation to combat misinformation and disinformation. I did prepare two questions that I want to ask to the panel members. So after the two questions, then I will open the floor to the audience. So if you have any questions, uh, please uh, type that in in the Q&A box anytime if you're a Zoom audience. Uh, if you are in here physically, then please think about what you want to ask. And as soon as we go through our discussions, then I will open the floor for you. All right, so if we could get the first question, and this is for everyone, including you, Michael. Uh, so do we need more specific or more regulations or specific regulations to combat misinformation and disinformation issues in Hong Kong? given there are alternative ways to deal with it. So this is the question actually Cliff Barrow ended the first panel. And for the second panel, I want to start with this. Do we need regulation or not? Um, and I know this is a difficult question to answer because we don't really have any draft or proposal yet. So when we say regulation, maybe we have different things in mind. In my view, like Chirian, uh, in the first panel, I think we need to regulate internet advertising first. You know, the way internet is designed right now, incentivized by the actors to produce problematic content, it seems like we are rewarding, giving some rewards to extreme content. And so to me, if we are talking about regulation, uh, internet advertising first, and if it, that doesn't work, then maybe we can talk about regulating speech, the actual content. But that's just my opinion. And I would like to hear from the panel, anybody has any views on this? Yes, Rachel. Thanks. Um, so as a journalist, uh, you know, I, I obviously uh, would prefer not to go down the legislation route because it often can be used um, to stifle free speech and op opposing voices and we, we see this in certain parts of Asia um, and I think often there are regulations in place actually that if used correctly can can be quite effective um, and there are you know multiple laws which control things like hate speech and harassment um, you know, this has been a topic of discussion because of the doxing that's gone on, on in Hong Kong on, on both sides. Um, and speaking on behalf of AFP, you know, we currently feel we can um, be based here. We cover the whole of Asia Pacific um, from Hong Kong, and then we have reporters in various bureaus across Asia. Um, we only operate in places where we feel it is safe to do so. And we are, the protection of our journalists is really important to us. So if and when uh, a situation destabilizes, then we will consider whether to move journalists or, or how we cover certain stories um, to keep them safe. And at, at present, I have to say, Hong Kong is still where we want to be and it's a safe environment for us in general. Okay, all right, great. Um, Olan, your organization is actually located in Hong Kong. There's no place to move like AFP. What do you think? Uh, I, I don't think the legislative is an uh, effective way to combat the spread of fake news or disinformation. So like what has been mentioned in previous panel, if the definition of fake news is vague, uh, it will affect uh, freedom of press and also information flow. Um, but we definitely need more intervention to reduce the spread of uh, and, and the impact of disinformation. So for government authority, I think it needs to develop a more effective uh, strategies in public communications. So instead of uh, antagonizing the people, it's better that they address people's anxiety because in, in a polarized society, uh, the, the, the sense of uh, populist sentiments will, will rise and then it will create distrust and 
people tend to believe in conspiracy theories rather than uh, facts. And also, I think uh, the government also need to increase its transparency in uh, decision making. So if the rationality of policy and if when journalists approach them to, to uh, look for information, they rejected it, then it will also create anxiety and also distrust in the community. Um, more importantly, I think the government uh, need to protect freedom of press and respect professional journalistic practice, such as investigative journalism, independent fact-checking, seeing them as partner uh, rather than enemies or, <laughs> or, or source of disinformation. Yeah, so I okay. stop here. So instead of regulating the media, actually supporting yeah. the media is the way yeah. to go. All right. <laughs> Any other views, Kenneth? Yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, after these few days, I find it very difficult to answer your question. <laughs> so the answer is yes and no, right. but I'm I'm not quite agree with the uh, with the words alternatives. Yeah, alternatives means if not A, then what else? Right? Mm. It could be a replacement. What we have been doing as a youth organization, I think, is not an alternative. It's a must-do item. It's about media literacy. It's about instilling the right values to the young people for education purpose for them to differentiate something which is real or not. There's always a saying about um, the wise men, the wise people never believes rumor, right? But there's a condition. It's, it's not about the individual is, is, is smart or not. It's about you have the wisdom to differentiate if the news is right or, or it's, it's, a, it's a real one or it's a fake one. So what our job doing is we provide scenarios, we provide training and experience for maybe primary students, starting from primary students and then secondary students, let them know what actually misinformation and disinformation will do harm to what else, to who else, say to the community or to, uh, we, we, have a, we have a workshop to let uh, uh, your, your neighborhood or maybe just your, your classmates to, to feel. What would you feel like if you say something else on a platform and you do harm and you and you make them embarrassed and feel them bad, make, make them feel bad. What would happen? We introduced the values about in the power of information as well as how if um, what if we misuse the information and misuse the channels. So that's basically what we're doing. And as well as an educator, we do believe evidence based education. Yeah. Even today we're talking about if we should or we should not or if it is um, Effective, effective. If, if legislation is an effective way to to make some changes amount to that, I just can't make use of the data and the researchers figures to point out um, will young people uh, tends to be having an improvement and more trust on the media and the content or not, even if it's the only way is the legislation. So to me, I, I would like to record the answer would be yes and no, but. Obviously, what we're doing is a must-do item, and we're clearing a more, more clear picture to see if this is necessary. Yeah. Okay. So when you say uh, research uh, in legislation, can, can you repeat again? Maybe I missed it. So research shows that legislation actually carves the spread of misinformation, but it doesn't work. Now, I, I think more or less our, our research is um, similar to Dr. Donald Michael uh -huh. just shared. We, we, we search about um, do young people realize about the information? Is it right or wrong? Is it true or not? And uh -huh. about the medium, about the consumption of the pattern. Do they realize if they pass wrong information, what will happen? Something like that. Oh, okay, okay. So what we have is actually the pattern and some historical data. Yeah. But one, one thing that I would really concern, especially when we consider the development of the multimedia, when we change the game rule or a new, a new media coming in, the game rule is totally changing. Yeah, today we just forward things, right? But in the future, it, it might not be forward okay. uh, in some other way. So I just think it, it's not just about legislation. So I don't think it's uh, alternatives, but a must-do item okay. with other organizations together. Yes, Alice. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, as we discussed in the first panel, there are many options you know, uh, to tackle uh, misinformation and disinformation. And uh, government regulation is only one of them. 
um, for me as a media educators, um, I consider uh, media information literacy as an option that are better contributing to competing the news. Um, a UNESCO specialist described media information literacy uh, as the first light or defense against disinformation. Uh, in my view, uh, the effectiveness of a media literacy education uh, may be slower to see, but it is a solution uh, that can uh, that can treat uh, both symptoms and root cause. Uh, it is because uh, it can not only uh, guide people to uh, verify information, reject fake news, but also um, how to better use information and access information. For example, apart from uh, teaching and fact-checking uh, skills, it also, uh, it also educate people to verify quality journalism and support quality journalism and other uh, quality information sources. Uh, so uh, people can get news from reliable uh, sources and have a better media environment. And it also reminds people to use digital media ethically and share accurate information. So it encourages people to be informed and responsible citizens. So it has a more a holistic way you know, to tackle uh, misinformation, in okay. my view. All right. So it's a long-term solution, education. Yeah, that's okay. right. All right. Michael, do you want to weigh in? Do you have any views on this? Um, well, I, I would tend to agree with what the panels have already expressed. I think if we consider regulation as a uh, top-down approach, uh, I much prefer a bottom-up approach in terms of the, uh, the literacy programs, the fact-checking, and just to, and through education. Um, because the top-down approach, I think as Clement mentioned, if you were to have a fake news law, then it comes down to how do you define fake news, mm. okay? There is not one definition. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm an academic, so I, I, we always think about definitions, how to define things. And all the literature that I'm reading right now is about how to define what is fake news. <laughs> is it misinformation, malinformation, you know, okay. uh, and so forth. So, so you know, this is something that academics have been struggling with, and I'm not confident for the government or any government mm. that to come up with a concise definition of what is fake news. Okay. Uh, anybody else wants to? Nope. All right. So, my second question is targeting specific individual on the panel, and I want to start with Rachel again. So, here's my question. Um, if you're from uh, Zoom, you can probably see it right now. So AFP already operates in many Asian countries that include you know, places like Singapore that has so-called POFMA anti-fake news law, right? Um, have you and your colleagues at AFP encountered any difficulties going about fact-checking or other journalistic activities because of this law? Yeah. Um, so I joined the AFP fact check team two and a half years ago and since I joined we haven't had any major issues in any of the countries that we operate in in Asia Pacific. Um, of course sometimes a fact check we publish does get a response either from a government agency or from someone we fact checked or a company that was involved. Yes of course there, there have been reactions and of course we also um, you know, admit if we ever make an error, there will be a correction issued. But as far as I've seen, um, the fact-checking process has been very smooth. Um, we we always strive to be um, a hundred percent accurate, and we we operate within the regulations in individual countries. So, as you mentioned in Singapore, for example, uh, there is a specific anti-fake news law we have to be aware of. Um, we do notice in, in Singapore there is less um, misinformation around for us to fact check. I will say that for sure, uh, compared to somewhere like India, um, even Hong Kong or um, Indonesia would be, you know, one of our top tier countries in terms of misinformation. Um, but you, you have to question as a result of that, you know, what else is being screened out? 
by this law and what else are we not seeing as a result of this law? Um, similar principle in somewhere like Thailand, which has had um, you know anti-government protests recently, um, many of which mirrored what was going on in, in Hong Kong. And um, if you are not familiar, then in Thailand, there are very, very strong laws against um, writing anything negative about the monarchy. Um, and we have to consider that when we ask our journalists to write anything. It doesn't have to be a fact check. It can be a general news story. Um, the, the safety of our journalists is very important to us. Um, so that is something that we consider every time we write a new story you know uh, how are we contextualizing this and are we going to say something that is going to get our journalists in trouble um it is it's a consideration but yeah. thankfully uh since i joined two and a half years ago we haven't had any major major problems um and in hong kong the same no no major issues as of as of yet well panel members if you have any questions just please jump in yeah <laughs> all right all right, so the, this question goes to all one. Many countries also have their own fact-checking operation. I didn't have time to mention this in the morning uh, presentation, the short one, but there are lots of countries that have their own governmentally sanctioned news agencies. They are calling it fact-checking projects. So countries include India, Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, Vietnam. As far as I know, in Asia, they are already operating. And according to my research, some organizations quite big. Thailand, for example, uh, Thai Thailand Fact Check Center, whatever the name is, they already have 400 people employed by the government doing fact checking. So, you know, compared with that, independent fact checkers in Asia is very small, and you run one of those in Hong Kong. So, what's your view on this? Uh, I'm sure that everyone would agree that in Hong Kong now, our, our community has become very polarized. People uh, with different political belief are living in a parallel universe, and they choose uh, the set of reality that they believe in, yeah, that are convenient to them. So there's little trust between the government and uh, quite a large number of citizens. So against such background, I think uh, independent fact checker can help facilitate the communication. Um, but for fact checkers to be effective in combating against this information, they will need support from online platform, government, and also the public. Uh, so far, uh, we've been operate for like one one year. So uh, for online platform, we uh, we had quite a good relation with them, like Facebook, Twitter. They uh, kind of give us um, some coupon to. Uh, push our content, yeah. Even though we are not in the international fact check network yet, um, for the government, as I mentioned before, it needs to be transparent and responsive to media inquiry and also fact checkers inquiry. But now, uh, this is getting more and more difficult, and we also need a open-minded public uh, uh, who can accept inconvenient fact. Uh, so far, on Facebook. Our experience is pretty good. People are rational, and although uh, in some cases they will react emotionally, but majority of them, they are uh, uh, really uh, uh, sensible. Uh, so I'm quite optimistic in, in this. And since we are a very small initiative, uh, have very lim limited resources, but we, uh, after evaluation, we feel that we did make some achievement. So like, uh, especially in public education and awareness, uh, because our, the, our fact checking uh, had a kind of open and also transparent uh, protocol. So some teachers, they did use our fact check report uh, in their curriculum. Yeah, so it, uh, I, I think uh, if you look at uh, 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 issues from, from uh, our, our work from this perspective, media literacy perspective is, uh, is, is more effective than, because yeah, uh, we cannot come back with the speak and, and also the scale of the, the spread of this information. So for government support, I will not oppose government uh, funding to some fact checker. 
as long as they take a non partitions approach. What do they mean? Because like uh, if fact checkers are just selective in their choice of work items, then it can be used as a kind of tool to repress oppositional ideas. So uh, for a fact checker, if they need to kind of uh, have their credibility, they need a very independent and professional uh, uh, protocol in a way. But um, our THK, like our public broadcaster, uh, it has been funded by the government for all this year and it has been very professional. But then now we see that its independence is being, is, is eroding. So this is a, uh, not an optimistic trend here. So yeah, uh, uh, so as far as I said that I do not oppose to funded uh, a fact checker, but we have to be aware of that. And what we need more is, um, uh, diverse media ecology so that different media outlets with different nature and they can call such check each other's work and such kind of ecology can can strengthen the public trust on the sector and then it also raises public awareness on information consumption so the worst scenario is the monopoly of fact checker yeah mm. I think. All right, thank you. Yeah. Um, so I think my next question is like extension of this. So some governments in Asia are trying to like you know t do fact checking as well, like journalists do. They are also getting into education. And in Hong Kong, I learned uh, this summer that some of the textbooks have already incorporated this idea of fake news and trying to teach primary school kids and secondary school kids what new fake news are, which Defining itself is very difficult even for academics who study this, but it's already in the textbooks right now in Hong Kong, which will be used uh, starting from September. So, Alice, you've been researching media literacy education in Hong Kong for many, many years. What are the issues we are facing right now in Hong Kong in terms of like teaching media literacy in formal education sector? What sort of things needs to be improved? Uh, well, so, uh the media literacy uh, program is an existing one. Uh, I have been researching in the past year. Uh, actually, has a large scope. Uh, news analysis is only one of it. Right. You know, so we media education also talk about uh, online games. You know, social media use, cyberbullying. You know, uh, all sorts of things. And uh, so uh, the curriculum, the proposed curricula you mentioned. Uh, actually, they are not media literacy courses. Mm. Uh, they just uh, include uh, fact checking in fake news. You know, uh, uh, they include a section. You know, on uh, fact checking. Mm. Well, so and um, actually, uh, teaching uh, fact checking and fake news in in classroom is fine. Uh, the key issues is how to teach it. Mm. So the lesson plan and pedagogy designs are, are important. And so far, we can we only see the uh, very simple uh, curriculum framework. The uh, the uh, textbooks actually have not been developed and released. So that's why we do not know the details yet. And, and I think you know we, uh, uh, that has you know uh, keep on uh, observing and uh, studying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So and uh, including the issue uh, of uh, media literacy at the moment. Um, I think maybe many people may be very curious about whether uh, our peers' media literacy in initiative is effective in uh, fighting against fake news in Hong Kong. As so many people still believe in uh, fake news and share fake news, right? Um, according to my research, um, media literacy and also other uh, uh, scholar studies, media literacy education do useful to help our, our students and people to detect fake news. But I agree that uh, the media literacy initiative we have done, you know, in the past, um, the impact on our Hong Kong society is still very small. Mm -hmm. There are several reasons. First one, 
is so far in Hong Kong, media literacy education has not received universal attention. So it is optional, it is dispensable. Mm. So what we have done actually reached very small part of the population. Uh, secondly, uh, most, of the, most of our initiative focused on students and ignore most of the adults. And the third reason may be related to the change in media environment. So in the uh, recent years, in the post two era, uh, we can see you know, people uh, in, in Hong Kong as well in many other countries, a lot of people have a global trust of a global crisis of trust. They do not believe in government, not believe in media, and even don't believe in professional and scientists. They tend to believe themselves and their friends. So in the past, media literacy education very much focused on teaching analytical skills, news analytical skills, and it is not enough. Uh, we found that we need to include uh, special pedagogy to advise people to uh, use, conduct our mindset, correct mindset to process information. Mm. And so in Hong Kong as well, in other countries, you know, media, media education expert advised that we should include the psychology theory to advise people to uh, avoid confirmation bias, confirmation bias. That means do, do not select and interpret information just to support you know, your own views, your prior you know, beliefs. And so I, I think you know, if we can update our media literacy curriculum, you know, we can meet this kind of challenge. Mm. For you, you also ask whether, how can we you know, improve media education you know, practices in Hong Kong? Like exam, for example. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think uh, it is in in my view. It is not only conducted in uh, classrooms. Right. It should be for all citizens. Mm. So that's why I hope that all stakeholders, including schools and you know, NGOs, parent groups, they will recognize the importance of media literacy, because in the past, media literacy is just optional and it is a, seems to be something extra and luxury. The, as one of the um, UNESCO officers said, nowadays, it is a necessity. It is a life mm. skill in the 21st century. Right. So that's why, and it is also for all citizens. So that's why I hope that you know, media education programs can be offered you know, to uh, all citizens, uh, even include senior citizens, you know, as you know, Senior citizens are very vulnerable to fake news. Right, right. Yeah. yeah, if I could just come in on that point, um, I absolutely agree with you, Alice. I think one of the trends we notice on the fact check team is that actually um, a large number of the people who spread misinformation are, I would say, aged between 45 and 65, and um, maybe even older. And it's not necessarily their fault, it's partly that you know, they grew up without social media. Um, smartphones are a relatively new phenomenon. And actually, young people, I find, uh, from our work, are generally better at deciphering fact from fiction. And they're not so easily misled by kind of silly hoaxes, Photoshop pictures, doctored videos, this kind of thing. Um, it tends to be baby boomers and, and older who, who are easily misled. And many of them forward things or share things without checking. It's not malicious. It's just they kind of believe what their friend shared with them because they trust their friend and, and they're not used to social media perhaps in the same way that young people are. So I think this is a big problem you know uh, how do we reach those people um, of course you can introduce education f in schools but those people graduated a long time ago and how are you going to reach them now um, I think it, it needs younger generations to speak to their 
their older relatives sometimes as well to give them some tips and to sit down with them and say oh what are you actually reading on social media and who are you befriending and and what accounts are you following because they're not always following the best um the best material right right well kenneth you learn you know yeah, extracurricular media yeah. literacy education projects so yeah what's your view on this they're, they're all all true and uh i i think well, we, we really have to collaborate, yeah. Um, I think my comments and my experience of working with young people, uh, yeah, like some, some young people here, yeah, I used to be a, a journalist student as well. O always, young people always like to ask why, right? And, and it is a spirit to, to differentiate the, the information. I always take a joke, like if there's a fact check machine, okay? I say it's a fact check machine, it's 100%, you put in every information there, it will tell you it's true or not. Mm. You put in the information and the machine tells you that it's true, 100% true. And you believe it. You ask why, why is it true? So you chain it back, you, you, you realize that something else have to back it up and you find it out. And I want to add a point, it's, it's really true. It's not just about young people. Some research and we figure out that actually a parent, how they use media and how they, uh, 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 the competency or the level of media literacy actually directly affecting the children. Yeah, but it is very, very, very interesting finding as well. They may talk in WhatsApp, right? Um, in Hong Kong, it's very special. They don't talk to one another face to face, right? They talk in WhatsApp. And when there's misinformation coming in in the family group, oh yeah, okay, maybe in, maybe some children will correct it. Now it's not right. Hey, hey, pa, it's not right because of what, 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 like that. But generally, no matter it's parent or young people, if you forward a wrong information or misinformation, when you know about it in, in, in Cantonese or, or we have a, have a, have a idioms like we're crashing the car as a wrong information, you never go back or, or majority never go back. I, sorry, I, I'm wrong. I sent a wrong information. So much less saying you talk to your parents that information is wrong. So the wrong information keep rolling out and the, impacts, the impact keep snowballing until until someone say, hey, this is really wrong, but who's that, who's that person? Who's that person? Somehow it's maybe the fact check organization, but you're all, all very, very correct. I, I think it should start from ourselves, start from everyone else to do the fact checking. But one observation I would like to share is young people who attend our workshop sometimes, they find that fact checking is very tiring, hmm. right? <laughs> why? Because you keep asking why. Right? Do you know you using Facebook, using Instagram to keep scrolling in information, right? For me, I, I'm not a, a, a youngster anymore, but I use Instagram. I think I scroll almost 400 or 500 pictures, information. Imagine you have to ask every information, is this true or not? Is it true or not? It must be my friend Photoshop on the shape, on the face. This is very tiring. How could you prove it? And they give up, right? It is all about the attitude and how you to use a right or instill a right values to consume the information and keep questioning. If everyone has this connective thinking, critical thinking, it's all fine because you can defend it. You know what is right or wrong and you stop it. Yeah, this is what we're doing to add on uh, Alice and, and, and Rachel. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah, Jennifer, I'm, I'm okay. So if you could, is there any questions from the audience? Yes. Uh, can you get the microphone and if you could tell us who you are? Great. Hi, I'm, I'm Joyce Lau. I'm from Times Higher Education. My question's for the three professors, Professor Chan, Lee, and yourself. Um, if, if there were a fake news law, or maybe even more broadly, national security law, does that affect your teaching or research on this topic? All right. Michael, you want to start? Oh. <coughs> just, my, just to check my understanding. So if there was the law, would it affect my teaching? Um, I, I guess not, because I don't really teach those courses. I teach statistics. <laughs> so, so unless numbers become also illegal, then, then I should be fine. Um, but so, so yeah, so for me personally, it would not um, uh, be uh, an issue, but I, I could imagine. Uh, um, it may have implications for for other colleagues who actually uh, touch on that. Um, 
but uh, but I can't speak for them. So so maybe yeah, maybe some other colleagues can can respond to that. Right, Alice. Um, well, uh, so because I'm in the field of literacy, I, I teach fact checking, so I don't think it can it will it will uh, affect me a lot. Yeah, so I just teach you know uh, what I'm going to to teach. Okay, so and that's fine. Yeah. Mm. Well, in my case, I teach journalism as well as uh, fact checking, and if it's a classroom activity, I don't normally care. I will just continue what I have been doing. But if we are publishing our students' work, let's say a website or sending it to other media outlet which might be interested in publishing our students' work, I would be a bit more careful than before right now. Uh, especially because when you do fact checking, you sometimes disclose who owns what account and under what context this person shared this or produced this content. And that kind of personal information, even though we don't say it in our story, authorities will know that, well, these guys must know who this person is in this picture. Maybe I will call this Professor Kajimoto and say, hey, what do you know about this person? Because we are investigating this person. And obviously, I don't want to get into that position because I don't want to obviously give the information to the authority. And before, under the previous system, journalists or media educators could say, no, no, this isn't information that our students gathered and I have no obligation to give it to authorities. Now, under the new law, I'm not quite sure if I can say no. So there are some sensitive things that I tell students in class that, okay, this is great work, but it's probably not a good idea to you know, publish. And I think that's AFP faces in some countries as well. Uh, yeah, um, we, we have to be uh, careful, as I said before, to protect the, um, the journalists who work for us. And, you know, we have to weigh up um, whether something is worth the risk sometimes, because if you end up, um, you know, if one of our journalists, God forbid, ended up being detained um, and court action was taken against them, then was it really worth it for publishing mm. the story? Um, you know, pro probably not um, in many cases. But then you you could argue in in the cases of uh, the Reuters journalists in in Myanmar. You know, maybe maybe they proved something uh, by taking a risk. Um, but it's a big personal risk. So, yeah, we, we have these discussions in the newsroom frequently. And um, if, if any new laws are ever introduced um, restricting what is published or, you know, potentially restricting journalists, then we have to have big internal meetings before we proceed um, in, with publishing in that region. Mm. Right. Anybody else want to do? Yeah. All right. Uh, next question, maybe. Yes. Okay, thank you. Hi, this question is for Kenneth. And first, thank you, all panelists. I continue to learn a lot. And um, given the education programs, and we believe education gives hope, what have you observed in the young people in terms of positively being influenced? Um, other than being getting tired occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have to do a supplementary. Even they get tired, they still try to find out something else which is true. Yeah. Um, more on our work uh, about the Federation, it's not just about media literacy. Uh, we also focus on the effect and what um, impact will do to young people for misinformation or cyberbullying. We figure out a lot of issues about emotional. Um, we try to do some prevention, yeah. But actually introducing the weights um, is not fast enough. We can't catch into the pace for the young people. We have some example, like um, nowadays a lot of young people want to be, um, I don't know, it's an occupation. They want to be in KOL, okay? Key opinion leader. In my age, Key opinion leader, there's a definition. What is key opinion leader? What is key opinion and what is leader? So not, but nowadays I was KOL, okay? They do, they produce content and go to the internet, maybe some um, like YouTube. It's very easy. Everyone can do it online. Yeah, they just tutorial, just Google, after effect, everything they can do. 
But what they face most challenging is after they publish it. They never imagine. They are haters, or they don't know actually they spread some misinformation or disinformation, and they find it can't take it back, and it snowballed out. Someone back up your video and republish it. And we try to do something else like we call it experience. We, we teach them to empathy and to pre-experience what will happen before you do this. Like one of the program we do is, yeah, it's easy to transfer the knowledge about how to do fact checking and we can do pretest and protest to see if the knowledge is, is better of an individual. But it's difficult to trace if that knowledge has been applied in their daily life as to combat what we want, what what we really want them to do in the in, in their social media. So in that case, what we can do is to provide the experience, like just not be the consumer of the content. Why don't you be part of the contributor of the content? Yeah, we we are not really a professional uh, journalist organization. We're not doing that, but we are we are able to do something else, like we can teach them the right value. We can teach them to prove the information, the right attitude to select information, process the data, and then to tune the angle and active listening to your audience, and then you produce the content and you publish. Then it's just not one-way communication. Today what we're talking about is information. Information flow is communication. So this is what we can share and, and yeah. I, I do think we have to one step in one in a, in a faster pace. I always make a joke. Like in NGO sector, young people, um, uh, youth work is, is, for me, is the most difficult because their needs keep changing. Yeah, take a comparison, I, I, I take no offense. Like elderly sector, you know what elderly mostly like need is, right? You, they need extra care, something like that. But young people know the thinking and they are facing different challenge, and when they don't do Facebook anymore, they go to WeMe, they use new media, and we keep catching up. And we, pre we, we do the screening about what's the risk, and then we try to communicate them in a new pattern. So this is, I think, not just um, an NGO or fact-checking organization, the parents can do that, yeah. Mm. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if I can answer your question, but this is really from the bottom of my heart. If we want to do a better education, we, can, we should start from, from this point and, and to speed up. Right, right. So from the very young age. Yes, yes, right. definitely. Yeah. Do, do you guys have any sort of like a trick that you can share? One thing I can share is that, like you said, when I uh, do a little bit of exercise with the younger kids, sometimes I do media literacy for younger kids as well. You know, what if this is your father? What if this is your sister kind of thing? So there's a Photoshop image. It's quite funny, mostly fake, but kids are happily sh sharing it. Would you like to share this? And you say, yes, yeah, it's funny. Would you share this if this is your mother? And then suddenly like, hmm, maybe not, <laughs> you know, because yeah. so that kind of empathy is really easy to teach. And it's just a little trick that educators can use to sort of, you know, uh, we call it sort of like, like light the bulb, bulb, light bulb in their head, yeah. Is there any trick, Alice, you can share that uh, concerning parents right now? Right, um, I would rather share more than I have time to share. Oh, okay, sure. Uh, because, uh, I think your mic might be. Uh, recently, you know, we have a course on media literacy, but it is a service learning course. Right. So um, we uh, try to have some activities, ask the students, you know, first of all, we offer lectures to them. You know, actually students do not like lectures. They still, they have to be educated, you know, about what kind of uh, the, the media literacy skills first, right? And then uh, after, after the lectures, they were sent out to try to share the media literacy experience with other young people. Uh, because we are college, and I ask them to share with primary and secondary students, and to find out, for example, find out their media literacy, uh, media media use habit, and then try to uh, share, you know, their media literacy skills with them. And I find it is very effective, and they are very passionate to do it. You know, they do not like just sit in the classroom to learn something, but they really want to apply something. And then when they apply something, they have to 
re review my lecture notes, <laughs> okay, to learn about those skills. And then when they share with the students, other, other secondary and primary students, they, they find out, oh, they really spend 10 hours on social media every day. And they also think about, how about myself? I even spend, you know, 15 hours a day. Is it too much? Yes. And then they also will think about how to try to advise, advise an other person, you know, to change their media habit. It is not difficult, but it is possible. And also uh, how to, uh, for example, analyze news, you know, uh, how to uh, think about, you know, the ethics of AI, all those things, and how to tackle of uh, ONI addiction. So I think that is, is very, very useful. Uh, kind of uh, uh, talking about, about experience. So I think that is using their teaching experience then. On the one hand, they enhance their own media literacy. And on the other hand, it also you know, can help other people you know, to notice their uh, problematic media habit and how to change it. Yeah. Mm. All right. So have yeah. students teach somebody else to learn. Right. Yeah, yeah I, I think that's another really pertinent point about how much time we are all spending online. Um, I think one of the problems with um, the amount of time we spend looking at our smartphone is we become kind of obsessive about clicking the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And as a result of that, we react very emotionally to posts and don't use our kind of proper rational faculty a lot of the time. Um, so I don't think this is just for young people, but I think um, even older generations, uh, we need to learn how to put our smartphones down and to try to limit how much time we spend on, on the internet. And actually it will uh, help us to decipher fact from fiction better. Um, perhaps you can read a book, perhaps you can watch your favorite news channel uh, on your TV. Um, you know, go for other sources of information and, and maybe it will help you to avoid being misled by silly hoaxes. Mm. We want, uh, fact Check Lab also runs uh, training for... Yeah, I, right. we have a couple of experience. Like for secondary school, one of our approach to is to trigger debate. So like pinpointing at a, a, a student say that, oh, you are so tall, and then the other disagree. Then how do you fact check whether she's tall or short? So they, they will start giving ideas and then, how, like, how about statistics? How about, um, uh, 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 like, um, direct measuring? Yeah, so this is one approach that we use. And then, uh, like, for older students, like in university, I also conduct a workshop among my students, uh, which is to compare different news source on a, uh, a specific news item. So like uh, maybe the Indian and China border conflict, then we can compare uh, China and Indian news source from social media, uh, state-run media, commercial media, and then, and then see what's the difference and then uh, teach them how to distinguish facts from opinion and interpretations because these are the basic uh, things in, 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 in uh, media literacy. I would like to add one one point about education because most of us are talking about knowledge transfer. Yeah, it, it's true. It's a foundation, but sometimes it's trigger their thinking. I always ask a question, which is they don't favor my my student don't favor. It's like, do you want me to punch in your face for ten times, or do you want one bad thing to go online and viral, two on one? Most of them, I I don't want them both, or any one of them. I don't want it. But what you trigger is like, actually this is from a verbatim of our cases talk to us. I'd rather to have 10 punch on my face. I know it's painful, but I don't want my bad thing to go online and get bullied. It could be as pain as like you, you, you punch on my face. But it, the young people never imagine. Of course, they can do different, might not be young people, maybe maybe us. Yeah, They never view in this perspective. And it, and it can be avoided because if you don't, be one of them to forward something else that the people don't want to to forward. You stop it, 
and you condo the impact. And this is about empathy. And this is very difficult to teach in all education sector. Yeah, I do think media literacy, we do need to consider such an experience and all that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I have a question here from Patrick Lamb. He's a um, researcher at HKU, and it, uh, the question is for Dr. Chan. Uh, what is the sampling method for the survey? <laughs> and is there any sampling bias reported? Uh, uh, he thinks that the optimistic situation presented is quite different from his anecdotal person, uh, you know, experience. Okay, okay. Um, methodology. Right, so um, so the Reuters, um, you, um, the survey is administered through YouGov, and uh, we use what is called uh, quota sampling. Uh, and so we, we try to, uh, because it's an online survey, so by definition we cannot claim that it is a representative survey of the Hong Kong population. Uh, we, cl we aim for a representative uh, population of the, the online uh, population in Hong Kong, and so we use the census data uh, to, uh, as to quota uh, to generate the uh, required um, quota in terms of the demographics, age, gender, uh, education levels, uh, and I believe also income as well. So that's, uh, so we use a quota sampling method. Okay. And did he talk about bias as well? Yeah, he's, he asked if, um, where did it go? I lost the question. Okay. Well, bias. If bias is reported within the. Uh, well, bias is inherent in any kind of quantitative um, um, research. Okay, and so all we can do as social scientists, as methodologists, is to uh, reduce uh, the bias as much as we can using, um, you know, social scientific methodology. Mm -hmm. I'm not, yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. right. um, I yeah. have another question uh, yes, here. Yes. This is from Dr. Jem from the National University of Malaysia. Um, I have been wondering if the researchers can highlight the uniqueness of their research, apart from samples, as I've heard the same discussion on the same themes in almost every webinar on information disorder. Perhaps echoing Einstein, who says, in effect, we can't use the same mentality to solve the problem that exists because of that mentality in the first place. So, is there anything outside the box that has been tried or tested in Hong Kong's context? Hmm. <laughs> Some groundbreaking insight from <laughs> a research which could solve this problem of misinformation. Anything that comes to your mind? I have one actually, um, not that great groundbreaking, but I think this uh, goes back to the issue of trust that Julian uh, brought up in the first session. Um, if you teach critical thinking skills, if you teach fact checking and media literacy, you tend to say, well, don't trust anybody, right? Check the information by yourself. You know, know where the quality information is, but then check the data, right? So that this, this seems like tends to encourage actually not to trust anybody, meaning it doesn't matter it's traditional media, it's your mother on social media, you gotta have to constantly like check by yourself. The problem is that and if you keep start doing it, the the dilemma is had like, you know, everybody believes they are the best. They know the truth. Everybody else is not really quite so I think in, in a way if you teach media literacy, you feel like you're encouraging that kind of attitude as well if you don't teach it well. And we did have um, online survey in seven Asian countries in 2020 in April. Uh, sample size was not quite big. I think we had around 500, 600 uh, from each country, but it's you know representative of internet users in each country. And we asked um, questions like, do you trust the media? Uh, mainstream media in your country, uh, have you encountered COVID-19 misinformation? And we actually tested the COVID-19 knowledge. So we had a five set questions of COVID-19 misinformation, and we asked them whether they can, they know if it's true or not. And we correlated that data with if they said they trust the media or not. And what we found, it's a preliminary research, 
but what we found was that people who tend to say, yes, I trust traditional media, they have higher confidence. There's a correlation. So people who trust mainstream media in each country, they are more confident about their ability to tell what is fake and what is not. If you actually look at the test results of the five questions, their score was as good as those people who are completely skeptical about traditional media. So <laughs> there are people who say, I don't trust the media. There are people who say, I trust the media. You test them on COVID-19 knowledge, the score is the same. So we didn't see any statistical correlation between trust and actual knowledge, or ac acquisition of knowledge. And again, it's preliminary, but it's something that I thought is something that we don't discuss often enough. If we feel, you know, in, in this kind of webinar, we often say, well, trust is important. We have to regain trust. But at the same time, I question, does that really make the, you know, audience better informed? Yeah. Um, yeah, I just had a thought that uh, although I'm not a researcher, I'm not an, an academic, I can only speak anecdotally from what I see as a journalist, but I don't think the um, realistic solution to this is that we're going to eradicate misinformation in, in any country. Um, so we have to instead, I think, look for examples of where um, misinformation is being uh, handled well and free speech is not suffering as a result so the best example of the countries we cover would probably be New Zealand um, where we don't see very high levels of misinformation at all uh, but we also see lots of credible media outlets who people trust and who people go to for their for their news um, there's a, a good healthy debate um, online in New Zealand uh, politically um, you can express what you feel and you don't have to risk um, being imprisoned so I, I think you know yes these webinars sometimes we are repeating the same ideas but um, it, th this isn't an, a new problem, really. This is a problem that has evolved, and uh, there aren't going to be kind of perfect solutions to this, um, but we can look to countries, perhaps, that are managing this better than, than others. Yes. I think there's a gap between our research and also policy, because like uh, what's been found that young people actually had um, um, more conscious about uh, this information because it's their digital environment. But for the old people, like uh, now in Hong Kong, you know that our uh, vaccination hesitancy actually comes from the older generation. Yeah, but we don't have uh, uh, the kind of policies that helps them in, in their media literacy work. And maybe, yeah, uh, uh, I don't know, like uh, we try to reach out to the community uh, through the district council funding. Yeah, and then our approach is more a kind of media literacy by means of uh, uh, teaching them how to do the new media. Because the, for the old generation, they do not know, know how to Photoshop or they don't know what's deep fake. Yeah, so just by showing them how to make a Photoshop is, is a kind of shocking experience to them. Yeah, and then I think the young people, they can teach the older generation on media literacy just by showing the how to do a fake photos and then a kind of raising their consciousness. So yeah, so policy, I mean, on the, on the media literacy policy, while I think we need definitely need more resources for, for those who are not in the, uh, grow up in the digital era. Okay, all right. Anybody else wants to? Uh, yes. Well, um, I think when we talk about misinformation, fake news, you know, very often we put emphasis on critical thinking. Mm. Uh, but to me, critical thinking is important. But I think another kind of uh, skills is also important is what we call reflexive thinking. Reflexive thinking means that, you know, when you do something, you know what you are doing. And when you do something, you have to think about your motives and then the consequence of what you, 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 you are going to do. And also to think about other people's motives as well. So you, uh, refre you, if you have that kind of reflexive thinking, you know, then you can have a better perspective you know, for many things. Mm. 
So, and as well as for doing research, I think in, uh, in the past we very often you use a quantitative approach. You use survey, right? But uh, for this kind of thing, maybe if uh, in the coming years, if of course COVID-19 is a barrier. Now, if uh, we are free, I hope we can do more focus studies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, focus group study. And uh, so that you know, we, can have, we can get more qualitative data. Uh, kind of talking about the experience of the young people. So it is very difficult to get that kind of data you know, yeah. from uh, quantitative research. So uh, qualitative research you know, uh, should be, uh, have more emphasis you know, mm. in the coming years. Yeah. All right. uh, kiss, OK. All right. Mm -hmm. We can take one more question, right, Jennifer? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, just wonder, uh, this is Keith Richburg. I'm uh, just wondering, in addition to the fact checking and in addition to uh, expanding news literacy, do you guys, does anybody think that the tech companies or the platforms themselves should be doing anything once you discover fake news on their sites? Mm. Um, I can respond to that. Um, so they, are, they already are, and obviously um, they're doing it to different extents. So. At AFP, we're part of the Facebook third-party fact-checking program. There are more than 60 news organizations who are part of that, and we're all accredited by the International Fact-Checking Network. Um, you can look them up online. That we, we all adhere to a series of principles to be transparent and objective. Um, I think Facebook is you know, investing a lot in this. Um, yes, they can always do more. They are the biggest platform, so yes, there, there's more that they want to do. Um, you might have noticed that Twitter has started to ramp up its efforts as well, um, you know, putting um, notes on certain tweets and saying this is misleading, uh, banning certain large accounts uh, from prominent political people. Um, and that is all, I think, um, a signal that, you know, tech companies are, are recognizing that they have to do a lot more because as many people will have read, um, many of their algorithms actually aid misinformation. Um, so one of the things that happens when uh, a fact checker from the third party fact checking program with Facebook, when we rate something as false or misleading, it actually demotes the content in the Facebook algorithm, becomes less likely to be shared. Uh, people get big notifications um, saying this is false and misleading. Are you sure you want to share? this if you've never received one that's great that means you're not sharing misinformation um, but a lot of people are receiving them every single day um, I think um, there's there's always more that the tech companies can do and and I, I appreciate that they are investing more and more money in this um, and I think it can only uh, it can only grow mm. Kenneth, you also work with Facebook, right? Yeah, sure. We 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 on and off keep working with Facebook in different aspects. Yeah, but um, we have some good experience. Uh, if if to be innovative, I'm just thinking uh, it could be challenging. Yeah, to be innovative, uh, a lot of people is blaming about a algorithm, right? Um, in real life, it's true. It's like we 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 have same interests, so we form a group. If we're not, we never talk to one another. And for maybe for some business purposes, yeah, um, echo chamber or online algorithm is a must for business purpose. But in, in right right now, what about we make good good use of data? If I I was captured with a patent having some depression, right, on Facebook, I, I I tend to share some information or share some images which is on dark side. Of course, there could be an approach to show some information or show some more news fit to link him to some positive power or to some groups that can support him. Um, this is one of the ways that they can help out. And on the other hand, I do think they, they're, they're improving. They're, they're, don't treat us as a CSR program. They are part of the community and they're coming in, joining in to do the R&D work and see how they can make the ecosystem better. This is one of the role and a big step they can do better with different organizations and NGO. Um, our uh, from from our work experience, uh, uh, like Facebook, Twitter, this kind of uh, social media platform, they did give us some support, but I think they need to do a lot more, like increasing their transparency, like how they flag uh, certain items as uh, fake or or, or disinformation, 
and then inform the community about that. Uh, and other things is uh, their revenue. Like Facebook uh, or, or other social media platforms, they gain revenue from their advertisement. And I remember during the uh, Trump's election, the US presidential election, I've like received uh, a whole month of our uh, advertisement by uh, this uh, uh, one of the, the, the poll Trump media. Yeah, uh, the, the uh, approach time. Like for a whole month, my Facebook timeline is the approach time advertisement. And then at that period, all the fake news about US uh, election, I, I think majority of 50% of Chinese origin pro Trump is coming from a push time. Yeah, and then, and then Facebook is getting the revenue from them. So they need to do like a auditing of, of their revenues, like, yeah, uh, like for this information source, they shouldn't take in the advertisement. I don't know how to do that. Uh, the best is that there should be some sort of code of conduct rather than legislation, but yeah, mm. they need to do more, definitely. All right. We can, we can just take one more question and then we'll have to wrap up the panel. Okay. It's right. from Professor George. Would you like to ask the question directly? Okay. Uh, no, he has a, a question for uh, Masato, and it's, uh, uh, he's seen some reports that strong independent public service media are especially important for making societies more resilient against misinformation. Is there some truth in that? Public service media. Um, not Strong, independent <laughs> public, public service media would be uh, especially important for making societies more resilient against misinformation. I have no idea, Joe. <laughs> 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 no. Yes. Yeah, well, maybe I can partly answer that. Yeah. I think um, from the research I've read, and um, actually from the data from the, the Reuters Digital News Report, um, there is evidence uh, to, to, to suggest that um, the, Nor the Nordic media, so countries in uh, Finland, um, Norway, uh, so, so with a strong uh, kind of a public uh, model, a public media model, they tend to do better in terms of, uh, of, um, of reducing the dissemination of uh, misinformation. So from the supply side, from the uh, um, yeah, supply side, and also in terms of the de demand side from the consumers, they tend to be more uh, kind of uh, savvy in terms of, the, of recognizing fake news. Mm. So, so, th so there may be some aspects of that so-called Nordic model, uh, and the data suggests that, yeah, from both the demands and supply side, there seems to be attenuating the, uh, the effects of misinformation. Right, but that's not cause and effect, right? Even if they correlate, it just means that Scandinavian countries tend to have more press freedom, more, uh, you know, media literacy, education, especially Finland, for example, is a success story when it comes to media literacy education. And Rachel, we are from UK, BBC is big. Fake news <laughs> problem is big in UK too. So, so <laughs> I'm not quite sure public service, you know, um, news organization is the answer. Like Japan, I think compared with other Asian countries, yes, we do have NHK, which is quite, you know, uh, big compared with other news organizations. Then our problem in our country is probably less than many other Asian countries are experiencing right now. But I'm not quite sure if NHK is the reason why. Yeah. No, no, you're right. I mean, certainly there's a correlational right. uh, aspect, but as to the exact causes, mm. yeah, just yeah, open the question. So. Right. All right, so I think it's time. Thank you very much uh, for staying with us until now. And Thank you. This is then. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we were going to have Professor Francis Lee, uh, the director of the School of Journalism and Communication from CUHK, to give the closing remarks. But he is now, um, I think, still at court. Uh, testifying as an uh, expert witness for the defense in the first national security law case. So in his place, we're, we have Professor Joseph uh, Chan, who has so kindly um, uh, come all the way over here to step in. 
He's the uh, he's an emeritus professor of journalism and communication at Chinese U. Uh, hi everyone. Yeah, uh, it is a uh, late afternoon. Um, Wednesday is supposed to be a happy day for me. Uh, we call it a happy Wednesday because uh, I and a group of friends play tennis uh, in this hour. <laughs> and uh, but I was called in by Francis. Uh, it was an an invitation that I couldn't refuse. Uh, but I'm happy here, you know, because I. I'm learning things. Uh, I also, you know, it is also an important topic. Um, thank you for all the presentations. Um, now, uh, misinformation or disinformation is an age-old problem. Uh, I think, you know, from the very beginning, Keith and um, Masato uh, and every one of us probably agree to this. You know, this problem st started, you know, uh, when human history, you know, began. Uh, whenever we communicated, uh, then, you know, uh, misinformation and disinformation uh, would come in. So it is not a new issue, but the thing is, it is enhanced um, by virtue of the event of inf uh, informa information technology uh, and social media, and also, you know, one thing that we didn't mention too much, because of uh, the increase of contestations, because of intensified conflicts, uh, polarization, you know, it is a time um, that marks all this. And fake news, uh, disinformation uh, tend to be embedded, you know, in these times of conflicts. Um, Cherian also identified, you know, an, another source of this uh, intensification of misinformation. That is the breakdown of trust. And I think, you know, this is a worthwhile topic for us to pursue further. If this is true, then the solution to it is probably different. Now, I will talk a little bit more about this uh, when I uh, wrap up the second part. So the, the basic issue is, you know, do we want regulation by the government or self-regulation by the civil society, the industry, the media? Um, now, that with government regulations, I think, you know, the government would think, you know, it is the best solution, most efficient um, way to solve the problem. But to the public at large, at, at least in Hong Kong and in many parts of the world, uh, there are strong reservations about this because of the negative consequence that regulations uh, may bring about. The major um, worry that people have is the potential curtailment of press freedom and the freedom of speech. Uh, this has to do with the muddying definition of false news, you know, as mentioned by Michael um, and many, uh, some, a few others. You know. It is not easy to define fake news uh, to operari operationalize it. So, fake news definition is rather weak and subjective. And in the end, you know, who is going to decide what is fake news? Now, in the case of Singapore, as I understand it, you know, the ministers have the right to de decide uh, what is false from true. So there is reason why you know, journalists and the public are afraid that um, 
false news can be equated as unfavorable news in the, from the perspective of the authorities. Now, it, becomes, it can become an, a good excuse for cracking down on opponents and activists. And if that is uh, put into practice and, or enforced, that there will, it will result in some kind of chilling effect. This amounts to throwing away the baby with the bath water. So if we can take it from here, um, we have to remind the government that we have to take the negative or at least potential negative consequence of legislation uh, in seriously. Now, this is especially true in the case of Hong Kong because press freedom in Hong Kong um, is at risk. As mentioned by some of the panelists, you know, press freedom in Hong Kong has been declining. Uh, it has been taking a plunge to many. Uh, on the other hand, the public uh, have taken the issue in their own hands. Uh, by this, I mean uh, we have been engaging in uh, media literacy, fact-checking in, in initiatives, um, the cultivation of critical uh, thinking. Now, all, the, the, all this is educational-based. Uh, the idea is to cultivate news consumers that can differentiate the true from the false, and also you know, to, uh, to have the ability to identify uh, quality journalism uh, and to pose questions on suspicious content. Um, the fact-checking initiatives uh, can be media-based or, or, or as NGOs uh, or based in ed educational institutions. Uh, they have provided some, um, they have offered or they have contributed uh, to the verification of facts in society. Uh, it is a beginning. Uh, the days for it to, to prosper has yet to come. One another um, important channel for dealing with misinformation or disinformation has been mentioned, uh, but not elaborated. I think that is very important, especially if we think if we take Cherian's uh, identifi identification of the cause seriously, that is how we can reduce or eliminate false information in the first instance. Now, much of the disinformation or, mis the, mi disinformation or misinformation can be traced to the source of the authorities or the powerful. Now that means transparency can really help in this case because the government can release uh, information timely, uh, they can have clarifications, they can have rebuttals of all this information and disinformation. Now if the government is very serious about it, and if they uh, take the sunshine rule uh, and put it in practice, then their disinformation and misinformation would be much reduced. Uh, that's why in the case of uh, United Kingdom, as far as I know, uh, they, instead of legislating laws, 
uh, regulating uh, misinformation at this point, they have a rapid uh, response unit. By that, the government monitors the dissemination of misinformation, and they would um, release information in response, quick response. That's why it is called rapid uh, response unit. Um, also, you know, the existing legal framework uh, has been able to deal with some aspects of misinformation, such as in the case of libel laws, uh, privacy ordinance, uh, the crime ordinance, theft of ordinance, um, and laws against inciting public nuisance. Now, this has been dealt with uh, to some extent. Now, I am not saying that you know it is adequate, you know, but at least you know the the basic framework is already there. So, um, after this exchange, um, if I am going to wrap up, um, what can I get from these panels? Now they have voted, you know, with the exception of Ronnie. Uh, I, I was saying everyone uh, would agree that you know the public, the media, and the industry have strong reservations, to say the least, you know, against uh, re legislation. Uh, they want the government to take serious consideration of the potential negative consequence. Uh, the government should be more transparent and more alert and responsive to misinformation and disinformation. Uh, also, there are also some an, uh, anecdotal uh, evidence and also survey evidence suggesting that uh, the public, you know, are also taking misinformation seriously. But the thing is, you know, um, they uh, sometimes, they do not own the skill or the time uh, to verify every information that comes their way. So there is room for the government to promote or to help to empower the public and the institutions uh, in combating uh, misinformation and disinformation. So the, um, at this point, when Hong Kong's press freedom is at risk, uh, we don't probably want another law, you know, to drag it down further. Um, of course, this is the, the this is my take of one person. Uh, hopefully, you know, my wrap up. Uh, of course, it cannot stand. It, it cannot. I cannot speak for everyone. You know, hopefully, my wrap up. Uh, we provide food for further thought on this. Thank, thank you. Uh, once again, thank you for all the speakers and our, our great moderators and our you know, director, Keith Richberg, and Professor Chan for stepping in. Thank you very much.